Number 10, Ma Balond. So Lucy Balond, also known as Ma Balond, was based in Fort Worth, Texas, and she and her offspring sold narcotics, including morphine, no-no snow, and spicy spoon juice. Lucy was often cast as the leader of the, you know, Balond crime family, whose members were convicted of narcotics crimes at least 30 times, 3-0, between 1921 to 1947. In 1908, the family moved from Grandview to Fort Worth, eventually settling in the Arlington Heights neighborhood. In 1911, her son Charles, barely in the double digits of age, impaled another boy and was charged with causing physical harm, but later released on probation. Later that year, her daughter Willie, then years old, was caught as part of a shoplifting ring of a dozen girls. Police later said that Lucy had organized a shoplifting school for her daughters, with their brothers posing as store detectives. Willie and Cora were arrested for shoplifting from department stores in 1912, and Willie was arrested again in 1912 for possession of no-no snow, and in 1913 for stealing dresses. Willie and Cora were charged with theft again in 1914. Willie was later quoted in the Star Telegram as saying that she was, you know, 12 years old when she first tried morphine then costing 25 cents for a big bottle. From 1921 to 1947, members of the family were convicted of narcotics crimes at least 30 times. Once again, 3-0. I had to say it twice, it's insane. In 1938, narcotics agents purchased and seized 2.3 kilograms of illicit substances from the family. Lucy, Willie, Joe Jr., Charles, Jacqueline, and Leslie were all arrested. Eesh, that's quite the family. Number nine, the Kelly family. So this was an American family of serial killers who operated between August and December 1887 near a town called Oak City, just south of the Kansas state border in no man's land, which is now known as the Oklahoma Panhandle. Yes, I know, I said Texas today, don't worry. They did have some stuff going on there. Just wait for it. Promise. The family consisted of William Kelly, his wife Kate, his son Bill, also called Billy, and daughter Kit. Originally from Pennsylvania, the family is believed to have killed 11 wealthy travelers. According to 55-year-old William Kelly's confession, he and his family moved from the Pennsylvania mountains to Kansas in 1869. They moved around to different places along the southern border until eventually settling in no man's land, around 25 miles from Beaver, Oklahoma. Initially dealing with cattle, the Kellys soon opened a tavern where they housed fellow cattlers and travelers. In the span of a few months, though, a number of people had disappeared mysteriously along the road leading to the tavern. Despite this, nobody suspected the family of doing anything until around December of 1887, when the occupants suddenly left the house without notifying anybody. A short while after, a traveler from St. Louis named S.T. Gregg, who had visited the tavern a while before, decided to stop by and check on the house. Upon entry, a foul stench overtook him, coming from a hidden cellar underneath the house. The bodies of three men, already in an advanced state of decomposition, were discovered, as well as a trap door under the tavern's floor. Soon after the discoveries, information from Beaver came that all four members of the Kelly family had just passed through town a few days ago, en route to New Mexico. A posse of 20 men was quickly organized, and the family's trail led to Palo Duro Creek, from where it appeared that their route had changed towards Wheeler, Texas. I told you. Texas. After a while, the posse caught up with them and engaged in a two-hour-long chase. Eventually, Kate Kelly's horse tripped and Kate fell to the ground, breaking her neck in the process. She was left behind and a half an hour later, the vigilantes caught up with Bill and Kit, but William managed to escape. Upon capture, Kit began pleading for mercy, only to be told off by her brother for being as complicit in the killings as he was. Yeah, you guessed it, that was the end of the family. But... According to a news report from contemporary media, an unnamed man from Kansas City who had investigated the notorious Bender family's house and the rumors of their deaths numerous times claims that the Kellys were in fact the Benders. He pointed out that both families' modus operandi, you know, family unit numbers, and other evidences proved that they are one and the same. Oh, who were the Benders? Well, I'm glad you asked. Number eight, the Bender family. So this family, more well known as the B-L-O-O-D-Y, Benders, were a family of serial killers in Labette County, Kansas, United States, that operated between May of 1871 till December of 1872. The family supposedly consisted of John Bender, his wife Elvira, their son John Jr., and daughter Kate. Contemporary newspaper accounts reported that the Benders' neighbors claimed John and Kate were actually husband and wife, possibly via a common law marriage, which is kind of icky. Estimates report that the Benders killed at least a dozen travelers, and perhaps as many as 20 before they were discovered. The family's fate remains unknown, with theories ranging from a lynchroom to a successful escape. Much folklore and legend surround the Benders, making it difficult to separate, you know, fact from fiction. It is believed that when a guest stayed at the Benders' bed and breakfast inn, the host would give the guest a seat of honor at the table that was positioned over a trap door into the cellar. With the victims back to the curtain, Kate would distract the guest, while John or his son came from behind the curtain and struck the guest on the right side of the skull with a hammer. One of the women would, um, cut the victim's throat to ensure death, and the body was then dropped through the trap door. Once in the cellar, the body would be stripped and later buried somewhere on the property, probably in the orchard, you know, 
It's good for fertilizer. Although some of the victims were wealthy, others carried little of value, and it's believed the family just killed for the fun of it. Alrighty, so what happened to them? Detectives following wagon tracks discovered the Bender's wagon, abandoned with a starving team of horses, with one of the mares uh, not doing so well, just outside of the city limits of Thayer, which was 19 kilometers north of the inn. It was confirmed that the family had bought tickets on the Leavenworth, Lawrence, and Galveston Railroad for Humboldt, and at Chanute, John Jr. and Kate left the train and caught the MK and T train south to the terminus in Red River County near Denison, Texas. Haha, <laughs> Texas, see? <laughs> and after that, nobody knows. So I'm gonna go with the theory that they became the Kelly family. Number seven, the Parr Empire. Alrighty, so after all the mass killing families, time to refresh with a simple mob boss style situation, as a little palate cleanser, if you will. Operating in the early 1900s, the Parr machine functioned on bribery, graft, and illegal donations. Political support came from the southernmost counties in Texas, and the machine could produce large numbers of votes, both legal and illegal, from the impoverished and uneducated working class citizens. While the Parr machine had always asserted undue influence over the county's affairs, it was not until Archer Parr that its leadership felt safely secure to overwhelm the remaining independent farmers by appealing directly to the county's new majority by offering them jobs, and in some cases cash directly from the county coffers in exchange for political support. George Parr engaged in the graft, bribery, and fraud that are, you know, often associated with political machines, and along with other large landowners and managers of landed estates owned by prominent eastern businessmen, Parr helped develop the practice of working illegal citizens and later using them for advancing political interests. More importantly, his own political career included serving as both the Duval County judge and sheriff. He also owned the San Diego State Bank and the famous Dobie Ranch, including the Parra's Los Horcones Ranch. He was also a partner and silent partner of dozens of other businesses, which seems like a conflict of interest. He was convicted of tax evasion in 1932 and eventually served nine months in federal correctional institution after violating his parole. Number six, Caracalla. I'm going to try and avoid bathroom humor as much as I can. But feel free to go wild in the comments. Have you ever been in the bathroom doing your business and suddenly your mind starts going and you're like, someone could easily take me out right now, you know? I mean, it's not like you can just stop what you're doing, you know, before hands reach out and grab you beneath the stall and you're like, ah, you know, like what a way to go, right? Exactly. Which is kind of why it's bad form to assassinate someone in that vulnerable space. Poor Roman Emperor Caracalla. I mean, not really, though he gave Roman citizenship to free inhabitants. He, he is considered as one of the most bloodthirsty tyrants in Rome, so not a great guy. His reign is one of the main reasons the empire fell. He made a lot of people angry, let's just say that. In 217, the emperor was preparing for a major campaign against the Parthian Empire. He was visiting a temple nearby when he was stabbed by a Roman soldier who was allegedly angry with him for not promoting him. While this was happening, he was busy relieving himself on the side of the road and he was just dead. Ugh. Bad form. But also, you know, not a good guy. Number five, Queen Caroline of Ansbach. I'm not gonna lie, this is not for anyone with a weak stomach, so be careful. This is not a good way to go. One of history's goriest deaths to be sure. Queen Caroline was the consort of George II. She was described as extremely clever, intelligent, strong in character. However, later in life, she became overwhelmed with extreme bouts of gout. They became so bad that she had to be wheeled around the castle in an ornate chair. The cause was a strangulated hernia, which developed after the birth of her youngest. Eventually, the pain became so bad that she couldn't leave her bed. Her womb had ruptured and she was bleeding internally. And then, I'm so sorry, her bowels exploded. Exploded. On November 20th, 1737, Caroline passed away, leaving behind this epigram. Here lies, wrapped in 40,000 towels, the only proof that Caroline had bowels. Ugh, not a great legacy. Sorry, girl. Number four, a deadly throne. Metaphorically, a throne can be deadly. Anyone who takes up that much power immediately has dozens of targets on their back. But imagine if it was the throne itself that killed you, literally. Bella I of Hungary did everything he could to get onto the throne. His father, Prince Vazul, had to rebel against his own father to get the throne, though instead he was captured and blinded. So, Bella and his siblings fled until his eldest brother successfully seized the crown. As per tradition, in Hungary, the crown was supposed to be passed from brother to brother, but instead, Bella's brother's son was named heir. So Bella organized an army in Poland, marched on Hungary, killed his brother on the throne, and took up his reign. He actually accomplished much in his reign, including crushing a pagan rebellion and asserting Hungarian independence. But then, in 1063, as Bella was walking up to his throne in front of a bunch of officials and sat down, the whole throne collapsed. The accident left him severely injured and he died from his injuries later on. His throne literally killed him. 
Number 3. Valyrian The words molten gold and game of thrones evokes a specific image for those who have seen the show, but did you know that they may have been inspired by the real life death of Roman Emperor Valyrian? Many rumors as to how Emperor Valyrian actually met his fate kind of range, but either way, it wasn't a good end. According to Lactantius, Persian King Shapur I captured Valyrian in battle and tormented him without mercy. He used him as a footstool, mocked him, flayed him with straw, but the most vicious was the rumor that he met his end by having molten gold poured down his throat. Another is that he was just kept in imprisonment until he eventually faded away into nothingness. His own son didn't even try to rescue his father after he was captured due to humiliation, but also because he was trying to hold Hold back a rebellion. What officially happened to the emperor, we may never know, but whatever it was, wasn't good. Wasn't good. Number two, Yorgi Doza. This is definitely the most brutal on the list, so warnings ahead. This dude was literally torn to shreds by people. I wish that was a metaphor, but it's not. Georgi Doza was a Transylvanian nobleman who led a Hungarian peasant rebellion against their lords. He went down in history as both a criminal and a Christian martyr. He was appointed by Pope Leo X to lead a crusade against the Ottoman with an army of 40,000 volunteers, mostly peasants. The nobles failed to supply the crusaders with what they needed and soon the peasants began to revolt against the nobles. Doza agreed with their grievances and organized a massive rebellion that led to all out war against the nobles. Noble manors were ransacked, nobles were tormented and not alive, but soon the aristocracy began crushing back the rebellion, and 70,000 rebels were tormented to death. But Georgi got it the worst. He was first forced to sit in a hot chair with a hot crown fixed upon his head, and then nine of his followers who were starved before this were forced to. Um, well, let's just say, make a meal out of him. Yeah, not good, not good, we don't like that. Number one, William the Conqueror. Just recently, I went to see one of my favorite comedians, Eddie Izzard, and through her show, I learned that William the Conqueror exploded. <laughs> he exploded! I couldn't believe it, so I had to look it up, and yup, it's true, folks. We have not one, but two people on this list that exploded internally. William ate as much as he conquered. Not only was he a glutton for land, he was also for the finer things in life, the finest foods, and the spoils of war. As a result, the Duke of Normandy grew in impressive size. In 1087, while riding his horse, it reared unexpectedly, and due to his size, he was unable to balance, and the saddle pushed so hard into his abdomen that his intestines were punctured. Doctors didn't have the means to perform surgery due to his size and their tech, so eventually the king succumbed to his injuries, dying six weeks later. Six weeks? That's a long time. But it doesn't end there. Oh no! He was so disliked that his corpse was abandoned until a wandering knight took on the deed. By the time his body finally arrived in Cannes to be buried, it had been weeks. The bacteria festered in his intestines, filling his body with putrid gas, and as the gravediggers were lowering him into his grave, the hole was too small to fit his now inflamed massive corpse, so they tried to squeeze him in by like jumping and pressing, and in typical Monty Python fashion, he burst and exploded all over the crowd. So no, he didn't die by explosion, but kind of internally, and then again. So. It counts, but what a weird way to go, and what an even weirder way to be buried. Number 10, the Borgias. The Borgia family, originating from Spain, rose to prominence during the Italian Renaissance in the late 15th century. The family played a significant role in both escalating political affairs, and they are often associated with intrigue, political maneuvering, and accusations of corruption. Rodrigo Borgia, who became Pope Alexander VI in 1492, is one of the most well-known members of the Borgia family. His papacy was marked by accusation of nepotism, corruption, and political scheming. Cesar Borgia, the son of the Pope was a key figure in the family's political ambitions. He served as a military commander and played a role in the complex power struggles of the Renaissance Italy. Lucrezia Borgia, the daughter of the Pope, used her marriages as a strategic ploy and was even accused in involving with poisons. The Borgia family faced numerous accusations including alleged bribery, simony, and immoral behavior. Some historical accounts suggest that they even used their influence in the papacy for personal gain. Of course, let's 
pretty not surprising. The Borgia family's legacy has been subjected with fascination and controversy. Various historical and fictional works, include books, television series, and films, have depicted the Borgias as often emphasizing their political maneuvering, ambition, and alleged moral fail failings. Number nine, Merovingians. One historical debate revolves around the question of why the Merovingian kings experienced a decline in their authority. Some historians argue that the internal strife, weak leadership, and the rise of powerful noble families and mayors of the palace contributed to the decay of royal power. Others suggest that the kings intentionally adopted adopted a more symbolic role while real power shifted in regional leaders. The role of women in this political family was a society in an area of historical interest and debate. Some historians argue that the Mavorgian queens such as Brunhilde and Fergagun played a significant role in political affairs and intrigue while others emphasize the limitation imposed on women in that societal context. And like in many historical dynasties, the Mavorgians faced disputes over succession which sometimes led to violence and internal conflicts. The lack of a clear and consistent system of succession Contributed to their instability. Number eight, House of Plantagenet. The House of Plantagenet, a royal house that ruled in England from the 12th to the 15th century, was marked by several controversies and events. One of the early controversies was involved of a sudden death of Thomas Becket, a Archbishop of Canterbury, in 1170. Becket and the King Henry II had a conflict over the authority of the church, and Becket's death in the Canterbury Cathedral led to a significant tension between the crown and the church. King John faced a rebellion by his barons due to perceived control of power, and in 1215, he reluctantly signed the Magna Carta, a document that aimed to limiting the king's power and establishing certain legal protections for subjects. The signing of the Magna Carta is a landmark event in the development of constitutional principles, and Richard III, the last Pelagenet king, is often associated with the mysterious disappearance of his nephews, the young Edward V and his brother Richard. In the Tower of London, specifically was the last of their known place. The fate of the princes is a historical mystery, and Richard III has been accused of ordering their death. Number 7, House of Alois. The House of Alois faced internal conflicts, external threats, and controversies that shaped the political landscape of the medieval and early modern France. These challenges contributed to the broader historical developments and transitions in European history during this period. The Hundred Year War, a conflict between England and France, began during the reign of Philip VI of Alois. The war had a significant political, economic, and social consequences for both countries. Battles, again, such as the Agnicourt of 1415 and the Joan of Arc's involvement, further fueled the controversies during this period. The Treaty of Troyes was a controversial agreement that recognized Henry V of England as the heir to the French throne and it disinherited the Dauphin of Charles. The Valois dynasty had complex relationships while other European powers including the Burgundian Dukes and the Habsburgs, marriage alliances and conflict with these houses influenced the courses of European politics and sometimes resulted into controversial outcomes. Number six, the Cat family. So, the Cat family consisting of Ronald Scott Cat and eventually his two offspring, Hayden and Abigail, were responsible for a number of bank robberies in the Portland, Oregon and Houston, Texas areas. After the death of his wife, Cat was facing financial difficulties due in part to his multiple substance addictions and unstable employment history. He decided to bolster the family's income by a Hey, why not? Robin Banks. He and his family committed several robberies, all occurring while the family lived a seemingly typical middle class American life. So originally they did it in Oregon, and then they decided, eh, let's start fresh in Texas. So in 2012, Cat, now with the help of both of his uh, offspring, decided to embark on a crime spree while the family kept up a facade of normalty. The first robbery that Scott perpetrated with the help of his family occurred at a Comerica bank in Harris County on August 9th. Scott and Hayden entered the bank wearing hats, sunglasses, you know, surgical masks, gloves, and painter's coveralls. Armed with lethal looking, uh, you know, Pew pew! Abigail waited outside in the family car and with stolen license plates and uh, everybody got away. Now the second robbery, which occurred on November 9th, took place at the First Community Credit Union in Katy. Now because preliminary observations of the intended target should a construction project was taking place nearby, Scott and Hayden wore bright orange safety vests and sunglasses to blend in with uh, the construction workers, which makes sense. This time Hayden wore a fake mustache and Scott wore his familiar painter's mask. Abigail once again drove the getaway vehicle. Together the two robberies netted the family around $170,000 from the Texas banks. Number five, Mark Anthony Condit. I swear you'll understand why he's on the list by the end. So the Austin serial explosions occurred between March 2nd and March 21st of 2018 in Austin, Texas. In total, five package explosives exploded, ending the lives of two people and injuring another five. The perpetrator, 23-year-old Mark Anthony Condit of can't say that name of that town. And the perpetrator was pulled over by police on March 21st and detonated an explosive inside his vehicle, killing himself and injuring a police officer. He was the eldest of three offspring and attended Austin Community College from 2010 to 2012, leaving without graduating but apparently in good academic standing. He was homeschooled by his mother, who in February of 2013 officially graduated him from high school. Yep, that was after his college stint because that 
totally makes sense. He wrote a lot of really weird blog posts in 2012 where he identified as a conservative who was not that politically inclined. He argued for the death penalty and argued against same-sex marriages and um, schmecksch offender registries. He was reportedly part of a club called the Righteous Invasion of Truth, and the club's members were homeschooled young people. They also practiced homeschooling, practiced survivalism, and held Bible studies. Hey, I see the evil in the family, don't you? Number four, Edward Harold Bell. So he was an American schmecks offender, killer, and the first fugitive to be featured in the Texan rendition of America's Most Wanted. According to his claims, his father, an oil field worker, frequently moved the family to various towns surrounding the Houston area, and allegedly suffered physical harm both from him, his scoutmasters of the Boy Scouts, and one of his cousins. Bell would also claim in later interviews that his father encouraged him to do violent crime, ranging from robbing banks and taking advantage of women sexually, in addition to encouraging him to take his own life. After graduation, he found work as a licensed driver and married his first wife in San Marcos, with the newlyweds then moving to West Western Texas, where they had three offspring. Following his capture in Panama City in 1993, he was extradited, convicted, and sentenced to a 70-year term for the killing of a Marine in 1978, and later confessed to killing 11 girls throughout the 70s. Okay, maybe don't claim to be from the Bell family if you ever go near Texas. Number three, Kaufman County killings. So in 2013, two prosecutors and a prosecutor's wife were killed in Kaufman County, Texas. Eric Lyle Williams, a former lawyer and justice of the peace, whose theft case was prosecuted by two of the victims, was tried, found guilty, and sentenced to death for two of the deaths. He was also charged with the killing of a prosecutor, Mark Hasse, but a decision was made to not prosecute him as he'd already received a death sentence for the others. His wife, Kimberly Irene Kim Williams, was tried separately and sentenced to 40 years in prison. Hey look, a family can be two people. Number two, the killings of Rick and Susanna Walmsley. Alright, so this is more of like a chosen family than anything, and as somebody with more chosen family than actual family, sadly that counts in my book. Rick and Susanna were killed on December 11th of 2003 in their home in Mansfield, Texas, as part of a conspiracy involving their son Andrew and two others. So originally they were hit by a tiny explosive and impaled to death in their home by Andrew's friend, Susanna Toledano. The killings were part of a scheme orchestrated by Andrew, his girlfriend Chelsea, and Susanna to collect the 1.65 million estate. The three conspirators also wanted to kill Andrew's older sister, Sarah, but she wasn't home that night. It's one twisted chosen family. Number one, the Bogle family. So, when uh, Bobby was, let's say, da 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 that much old in 1969, he woke up on Christmas morning to a heavy metal wrench in a plain brown paper bag under the tree. Later that day, he and his brothers used the wrench to break into a local grocery store and steal pop, making his father, a career criminal who went by the name Rooster, proud. This family crime spree spanned four generations and crossed multiple states, from Texas to Oregon, beginning in the early 1920s with ancestors who were moonshiners and carnival workers and involved hundreds of felonies covering just about every genre of lawlessness, from death and sodomy to burglary and insurance fraud. They stole everything, from chickens and cows to lumber and metal, and once broke into a government-run fish hatchery just to gorge on salmon. When the children were barely in middle school, they were already stealing 18-wheelers. Unlike other vicious families on this list, being part of a close, loving, and supportive family is what made them what they are. Granted, nobody in the family was especially bright, they killed people and they would make calls to their mother from the victim's home phone, and they once melted a stolen safe with a torch and tried to spend the bird money. I feel like y'all get the gist of it, but it's quite the family legacy. Number 10, Barbara Opal. Barbara Opal needed money, and she was living with Jerry Duane Heyman, age 60 and his mother, 89. Including living with her 13-year-old daughter, she thought, hey, you know what? I know these old people we're living with has money, so I'm going to hire my daughter and her friends, or five teenagers, and tell them to steal $40,000 from Jerry and his mother. So she hired her 13-year-old daughter, paid $220 to a 14-year-old named Kyle, and his 13-year-old cousin, $100, and a 17-year-old Jeffrey Goat to get a, to have a getaway car. The five teens ambushed Hyman and attacked him with knives and baseball bats. Hyman's body was found eight days later in a shallow grave roughly 10 miles from the house, and Barbara's other children age 7 and 11 were instructed to mop up the blood. During the trial, Opal denied that she wanted him dead. In fact, she would say that she was telling her friends as a joke, I just wish he was dead. Not that he actually was dead. After all, language is important. But what was also important is the fact that she was found guilty and barely skimmed the death penalty as the jury could not find a unanimous decision. Following her conviction, she was banned to contact her children or be in the same prison with them as her daughter Heather pleaded guilty of the first degree at the age of 14. She received life in prison with a non-parole of 22 years, making her only eligible as of now now, 2023, as she is now 36 years old. Opal is currently incarcerated at the Washington Correction Center for Women, and her case has been featured in shows with the episodes titled Mommy's Little Killers. Number 9, Buffalo Crime Family. The Italian American Organized Crime Syndicate have been also called as the Buffalo Mafia, located in Buffalo, New York. Like all other organized crime families, they have engaged in various criminal activities over the years, including extortion, racketeering, illegal gambling, loan sharking, and 
trafficking. They were also established in the 1930s, and over the years, law enforcement's efforts include successful prosecutions and increased scrutiny have weakened the Buffalo crime family. Additionally, internal conflicts and changing criminal landscapes have impacted its influence. The activities of the Buffalo crime family have a significant impact on the city of Buffalo itself and its surrounding region, and they have been involved in various criminals' enterprises and have influenced the local economy and social dynamics. Last update of this family was of January 2022, as their power and influence has greatly diminished compared to its formative years. It's believed that the family's activities have become more low profile and focused on traditional organized crime enterprises. Number 8. Turpin The Turpin case refers to a severe and widely publicized case of harm and mistreatments and captivity involving the Turpin family. The case came into light of January 2018 when David and Louise Turpin were arrested for holding their 13 children captive in their home in Paris, California to USA. Turpin children ranged in age from 2 to 29 years old at the time of the discovery and were found malnourished, living in vulgar conditions, and subjected to severe physical and emotional harm, often kept in locked rooms with limited access to food and basic necessities. They were allowed to shower only once a year and were not permitted to engage in normal childhood activities, and the case came into light when one of the Turpin daughters, 17 year old at the time, managed to escape through a window and contact the police. She used a deactivated cell phone found in the house to make an emergency call. David and Louise Turpin were arrested on January 14, 2018 and were initially charged with multiple counts of torment, false imprisonment, and more. They pleaded guilty to 14 charges. The Turpin case received significant media coverage and sparked a national and international discussion on child harm, neglect, and the role of child protective services. But unfortunately, the same child services that were meant to protect the children of this family also resulted in them being in foster care systems that also failed them and caused more harm. In a general nutshell, a complete and utter disaster. Number 7. Sante and Kenneth Kimes Sante and Kenneth Kimes were a mother and daughter duo involved in a series of notorious criminal activities including fraud, identity theft, and mur- uh, I can't say murder. Sante and Kenneth Kimes were a mother and son duo involved in a series of notorious criminal activities including fraud, identity theft, and killings. Sante Kimes were born in 1934 and her son was born in 1974. They were involved in various fraudulent schemes including embezzlement, insurance fraud, and theft. They were used multiple aliases and false identities to carry out their schemes. And finally, after a fatal crime committed by the two of the life of David Kasdan. Kasdan was a wealthy New York businessman who they had befriended and only had the intention of killing him to somehow attempt to steal his fortune. The investigation into the crime of David revealed a history of criminal activities by the by the Kemsies, and law enforcement agencies in several states had been investigating t them for a several range of offenses. In addition of the crime of David, the Kemsies were linked to other criminal activities including disappearance and presumed killings of other individuals who had been associated with them. In 2000, Sante and Kenneth Kames were both convicted of multiple charges, including death, conspiracy, and fraud. They were both sentenced in life imprisonment and without the possibility of parole. Number six, the Carolingians. The controversial and challenges faced by the Carolingians dynasty reflect in the complex political, social, and economic dynasties of their time. The eventual fragmentation and decline of the Carolingian Empire paved the way for the rise of new political entities, resurrection of medieval Europe. After the death of Louis the Pious, the empire faced internal strife over succession. The Treaty of Verdun in 843 divided the empire into three parts. Among Louis' three grandsons, marking the beginning of the separate kingdoms of West Francia, East Francia, and Middle Francia. This division contributed to the fragmentation of the Carolingian realm, and the Carolingian Empire faced repeated Viking raids and invasions during the 9th century. These raids led to widespread devastation, economic disruption, and challenges to the Carolingian authority. The inability to effectively repel Viking incursions raised questions about the empire's ability to provide security, and the internal struggles, the power struggles, conflict among the rulers and their noble supporters were reoccurring issues among the time. Civil wars such as rebellions against Charles the Bald, great name, in West Francia and Louis the German in East Francia and high highlighted the instability within their empire. Number 5. House of Lusignan The House of Lusignan, the medieval French noble family, which again, my bad if I can't say their name, I mean, I think they're still around, became particularly notable for its involvement in various European regions including Cyprus and the Kingdom of Jerusalem during the Crusades. Guy of Lusignan, a member of the Lusignan family, became the king of Cyprus after the conquest of the island by Richard of the Lionheart during the Third Crusade. This event marked the beginning of the Lusignan dynasty rule in Cyprus. However, the circumstances of Guy's rule was very controversial as he faced opposition from local nobles and factions. The Lusignans were also involved in the Kingdom of Jerusalem during the Crusades. The loss of Jerusalem in Saladin in 1187 was a significant blow, and the subsequent attempts to regain control faced challenges. The fall of Acre in 1291 marked 
marked the end of the Crusaders' presence in the Holy Land. James II of Cyprus faced controversies during his reign, marked by conflicts by the Venetians and internal oppositions, and his rule was characterized by the political intrigue and financial difficulties, and he eventually abdicated in favor of his daughter, Charlotte. The Lusignanins were initially a prominent noble family in France before branching out to other regions, and their involvement in various political and military activities in France added to the family's overall historical significance. Number 4. The House of Lancaster and York as mentioned in number 5, was initially a prominent noble family in France before branching out to other regions, their involvement in various political and military activities in France added another family's overall historical significance. As we know from number 8, one of the most enduring controversies of the War of the Roses is the fate of the young princes in the tower, Edward V and his brother Richard, who disappeared while under the guardianship of their uncle, Richard III. The mystery surrounding their disappearance had led to various theories, including possibilities of their death, and the execution of Richard, Duke of York, the father of Edward IV and Richard III, was a pivotal event that intensified hostilities between the houses. It set the stage for further conflicts and fueled the desire for vengeance. The Battle of Towtown was one of the largest, bloodiest battles of the War of Roses. The Yorkist victory of Towtown secured the throne for Edward IV, but was resulted in significant of casualties that further enmity between the houses. The War of Roses left a lasting impact on the English history, shaping the course of the monarch and influencing the subsequent events. Number 3. The House of Draculesti Vlad the Impaler belonged to the House of Draculesti, a noble family with the ties of the Order of the Dragon, a chivalric order. The name of Draculesti is often associated with the Romanian word Dracul, meaning devil or dragon. The association of the dragon is sometimes linked to the title Dracula, famously associated with the vampires in later folklore. Vlad's father, Vlad II, was the member of an order of the dragon. However, the circumstances surrounding his reign and relationship with other nobles, including political allegiance and conflicts, have been subject of historical debate. Vlad and his younger brother, Radul, was held captive by the Ottoman Empire as a form of assurance for their father's loyalty. Vlad's imprisonment and the events that led to his release are not entirely clear and there are different accounts of the conditions of his captivity and return to Wallachia. One of the most controversial and notorious events associated with Vlad the Impaler is the night of is the night attack of the Trevogati in 1462. After reclaiming the throne, Vlad launched a brutal campaign against the Ottomans and his political rivals. Thousands were reportedly impaled on long sharp stakes earning him the epithet the Impaler. The controversial aspect of Vlad's rule has contributed his lasting legacy in folklore, popular culture, as Bram Stoker's Dracula drew inspiration from Vlad the Impaler. The character of Count Dracula is often associated with this historical figure. Number 2. House of Sforza House of Sforza initially gained power in Milan through military prowess. Francesco Sforza, the founder of the dynasty, married Bianca Maria Visconti, an illegitimate daughter of the last Visconti du Duke of Milan, and seized control of the city. This military takeover raised questions about the legitimacy of their rule, as Galenzio Maria Sforza, son of Francesco, faced controversy during his rule due to his lavish lifestyle, patronage of the arts, and alleged of tyranny. His reign was marked by political intrigue, cruelty, and a focus on personal indulgence leading to both administration and criticism. But then Galizio Maria Sforza was assassinated in 1476, allegedly by his conspirators by his own court. The circumstances surrounding his assassination and identities of the perpetrators are subjects of historical debate. Some believe that his own relatives were involved with the plot, as Ludovico Sforza, also known as Ludovico Il Moro, usurped power from his nephew, whom he had previously served as regent. And the Sforza family was known for his intricate political maneuvers, forming alliances with various Italian states and European powers. These alliances sometimes led to conflicts and controversies as the family navigated the complex web of renaissance diplomacy. And finally at number 1, the Habsburgs. Hass's family has expanded as one of the longest reigning as well as one of their two branches, both Spanish and Dutch relations. This family is the most evil as they use their political powers and means to control so many countries around the world. Countries that still hold their colonial rule in their culture, food, language, and in some cases their name. Philip II of Spain, a member of the Habsburg dynasty, was a staunch supporter of the Catholic Church and the Spanish Inquisition. The Inquisition was responsible for persecuting heretics and religious deniers and its methods were brutal and controversial. Maximilian I, Holy Roman Empire and member of the Habsburg family, dealt harshly with the Anabaptists during the German Peasants' War. He ordered the execution of Anabaptist leaders contributing to religious tensions in the Holy Roman Empire, and Ferdinand II, Habsburg ruler of the Holy Roman Empire, played a central role in the Thirty Year War. His policies aimed at recatholizing areas that had adopted Protestantism led to widespread conflict, destruction, and loss of life. The assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand, heir to the Austrian Hungarian War, was a key trigger for the World War I. The subsequent action of the Habsburgs led Austrian Hungarian Empire and issuing an ultimatum to Serbia and entering the war had profound and far reaching consequences. As his family ties into so many conflicts in war as a result of loss of life, is why they're number one due to their obsession in this era as time of expansion of land and rulership and religion. Number 10, King Henry I. We've all been there. 
mostly on holidays where the food was just so good, we couldn't stop eating, we got so full, we wish we could die. I personally could talk about food for hours. I have a 10 minute limit with my boyfriend because uh, otherwise it just gets out of hand. True story. What is also a true story is that King Henry the first died from eating too much of his favorite thing. Henry loved a medieval delicacy called lamprey pie, a jawless giant leech like fish that was like sweetened with syrup. It was really gross and weird. But he loved it. He died at Lyons La Forêt near Rouen, Normandy in December 1135 CE. He was supposed to go hunting but had eaten so much lamprey pie that he fell sick with food poisoning. His chronicler, Henry of Huntington, said that he died due to a surfeit of lamprey. He wanted to have his body taken to Reading, which was a monastery he founded with 200 monks. They had to wrap his body in cowhide, cover it in herbs, scented oil and salt, and remove his organs in order to preserve him for the journey. The man who removed his brain reportedly died due to a strong pervasive stench. So not only did the king die, he took someone else down with him. Number 9, King Alexander. And no, this is not about Alexander the Great, different guy. Though he did die mysteriously as well, maybe we'll cover that in part 2 if it so pleases you, let us know in the comments. I'm actually talking about Alexander who was king of Greece for a while in the 20th century. He ruled for all of 3 years until he died, tragically, after being bit by a monkey. Yep. That's true, yes, a monkey. Not a tiger, not a lion, a crocodile, or a hippo, a monkey. Sadly, this is his legacy. This is all people remember of him. <laughs> he took up the throne after World War I after his father abdicated because he was seen as pro-German. After the Allies won, a political platform called Great Greece began. Their aim was to capture the Ottoman Empire and seize all of their land. They invaded Turkey, but Alexander was fated for another destiny. He was visiting the Royal Gardens on September 30th, 1920, and was strolling along with his dog, they came across a Barbary macaque monkey and his dog attacked. The king rushed forward to separate them, but the monkey had friends. Another monkey rushed forward to protect his buddy and bit the king in the leg, which later became severely infected. Doctors acted too late to remove the leg, and so he died three weeks later from sepsis. He was only 27, and he was remembered because he died from being bit by a monkey. Number 8, Phalaris. What goes around comes around. Despite the actual death being very dramatic, it does have a kind of poetic justice to it. Phalaris was referred to as the tyrant of Agrigas Sicily. This guy made cruelty look like an art form. He was known for punishing his victims by putting them into a bronze bowl that he would heat with fire beneath. Yes, I'm talking about the brazen bull, a hollowed out bronze bull that would transform the cries of its prisoner into the bellows of a bull as it slowly roasted to death. Cruel entertainment. The first person to be punished was allegedly the designer of the contraption himself. He gained power after taking on the responsibility of building a temple of Zeus. He armed his workers and seized power, but they would soon all regret it. A man named Telemachus eventually overthrew this horrific ruler, and you guessed it, he was thrown into the very bull he used to unalive countless people. Ouch. Number 7, King Richard the Lionheart. Look, we all know I'm on the Richard the Lionheart train because I just finished reading about the Third Crusade. Madness, utter madness, Richard was born for battle. Saladin had never faced nor encountered any warrior like him. They were so equally matched. Saladin was also really awesome. I should do a video about him. Saladin would watch him fight and was in such awe he sent him two of his best horses in the middle of a battle. Because such a man should not be without his horse. He would literally like, like, plow through his enemies like a bulldozer, at times falling ill due to the stench of battle but never succumbing to it. He had so many encounters with death that he seemed to be like invincible, immortal even. Which is why his death is so strange to me and so anticlimactic. He was walking towards a battlement un- armored and a vengeful boy took advantage and shot him in the arm with an arrow. Richard jumped on his horse and went to a doctor, but the doctor was terrible at his job, basically butchered his arm and caused him to get gangrene, therefore a death sentence. He had the bowman brought to him and asked him why he was his downfall, and this is where it kind of gets really crazy. The boy replied that Richard had slain his father and brother and that he would accept any punishment he was given. Crazy. Richard was so in awe of the guy that he ordered instead that the boy not be harmed and instead be given enough money to live out the rest of his days happily. Sadly though, after Richard died, people were so bereft that his wishes were ignored and the bowman was punished and killed. So very, very sad, but what an anticlimactic death for 
Richard the Lionheart, but also what a proud thing to do. Number six, the Vogels. In the case of the Vogels that had ended after having 60 members of the family in jail or in prison, the statistics of this family is actually pretty extraordinary and in the book I mentioned in the opening, In My Father's House by Fox Butterfield, discovered in his research of this family and how many members there were that were convicted at one point in their life. Looking at family values and behavior in the cases of the Vogels, they were actually very conscious of intimidating the behavior of their father and their aunts and uncles and grandmothers and grandfathers, an opinion that been fundamental to our understanding of human nature since when it comes to the psychologist Harry Harlow, Harlow demonstrated that a strong emotional bond with one's parents and a secure attachment can make all the difference in a child's emotional and social development. In this family, crimes include robbing, fraud, drug possession, child endangerment, death, drunk driving, kidnapping, physically harming somebody, strangulation, and so much more. But one member of the family decided to break the cycle, Ashley Bodle, as the first college graduate of her family in 150 years. And I wish Ashley a heartfelt good luck in her endeavors. Number five, Gertrude Benazwiski. Gertrude was an American woman who gained infamy for her involvement in the torment and death of Sylvia Likens, a 16 year old girl in 1965. The case is often referred to as one of the most gruesome and shocking crimes in American history. Gertrude was a mother of seven children. Sylvia Likens and her sister, Jenny Likens, were left in the care of the family by their parents who were traveling with a carnival. Gertrude was paid by the girl's parents to take care of them, and over a course of several months, Sylvia was subjected to extreme physical and emotional harm at the hands of Gertrude, her children, and several neighborhood youths. Apparently, one of Gertrude's children was very jealous of Sylvia. The abuse included beatings, burnings, and other forms of torture. And in October 1965, Sylvia succumbed to her injuries and died as a result of the prolonged harm. Sylvia's death was eventually discovered by authorities and charged in connection of Sylvia's murder. So the entire neighborhood was basically in on it. She was initially sentenced to death, but her sentence was later commuted to a life imprisonment and she's paroled in 1985, but she died of lung cancer in 1990. Number four, Rivera. Although the Rivera family's photos on social media suggest a very close group with a loving get-togethers, community service, and family outings, have an unfortunate strain of pain and remorse. Angel Rivera and his son Christopher Otero Rivera Montalvo husband had been arrested for killing of Nicole Montalvo. Wanda Rivera, the family matriarch, is accused of tampering with evidence and lying to investigators. And Nicholas Rivera, the family's youngest son, is considered a person of interest in Montalvo's killings. Montalvo's remains were actually found in the Rivera's property in St. Cloud and a vacant lot on Henry J Avenue owned by Nicholas Rivera, who also faces eight unrelated counts of possessing CP. The Florida County Sheriff Russ Gibson called it probably the most gruesome crime scene he has ever seen in 32 years of law enforcement. Little information has been made public about the investigation and according to the judge, leading the trial has said if the crime doesn't deserve a life sentence then what does? Both Christopher and Angel were sentenced to life prison for second degree. Additionally, they both received another 15 years for dismembering a human body and another 5 for tampering with the evidence. Number 3, Daybell. Lori Vallow Daybell is an American woman who gained national and international attention due to her involvement in a complex and tragic case involving the disappearance and death of her children. Lori Vallow has been married multiple times and her most notable marriage was to Charles Vallow who died in July 2019 and then Chad Daybell, an author of an apocalyptic themed books where she married shortly after the death of Charles. Lori Vallow's children, Tylee Ryan, age 17, and Joshua J.J. Vallow, age 7 years old, were last seen in September 2019. Their disappearance raised concerns and it was later to reveal that Lori and her new husband, Chad, were uncooperative in providing information about their whereabouts. Lori and Chad faced increasing scrutiny for the law enforcement and the public. They were eventually located in Hawaii and were served with court orders to produce the children. Lori was arrested in Hawaii and extradited to Idaho, and she faced multiple charges, including abandonment and contempt of court. The remains of Tylee Ryan and JJ Vallow were discovered on Chad Daybell's property in Salem, Idaho. Autopsy later confirmed their identity. Following the discovery of the bodies, both Lori and Chad faced additional charges, including conspiracy to commit death. Their cases gained widespread media attention. Number two, Daniel and Jessica Groves. Noted in local news in Ohio, the parents of a baby boy was found dead in a well and have been guilty on multiple charges. The jury convicted Jessica Groves on all 11 accounts, including death, and Daniel Groves on all but one charge, aggravated death. The couple was convicted on what would have been their baby Dylan's Groves' first birthday. Following their conviction, Jessica was sentenced to life in prison without parole, plus an additional 32 years, and Daniel was sentenced to 47. The couple stood trial for their death of their two-month-year-old son. They were arrested on June 2019 after Dylan's decomposed body Body was found at the bottom of a 30-foot well near their home. According to the county coroner's office, the two-month-year-old's body was wrapped in plastic bags and duct tape and then placed in milk crates cured by chains, padlocks, and zip ties. Dylan's cause of death was determined as homicidal violence, and the child had survived multiple bone fractures and broken ribs, as well as methamphetamine and amphetamine was found in his system. The duo Daniel and Jessica were harmful and had purposeful damages, and Dylan had initially placed in the foster care after he was born with drugs in his system, but the failure of the foster system again allowed them to have access to their child. 
again. That the case of Dylan had brought national attention to Ohio's opioid epidemic and the state family's reunification process. Even the director of the county's child services stepped down after the agent's mishandling of Dylan's case that resulted in his death. Number one, Sackler. Speaking of opioid epidemic crisis, want to know who was responsible in a wider scale of this crisis? Yes, I know, maybe you have heard of them considering they own a large pharma company that ended up going on bankrupt. But hey, don't worry, these rich folks are okay as they later founded another company called Mundi Pharma, which is a British multinational research-based company that is located in the UK, Canada, Germany, and Singapore. Not a lot of people know about them, so it's worth noting who's responsible for the opioid crisis due to the irresponsibilities of this family. Geographically, specifically, the opioid crisis in the United States and Canada. And also it's worth noting that they were called the most evil family in America, as well as the worst dealers in history multiple times. And considering the fact that they had over 1,600 cases against them as they persuaded the American medical market that strong opioids should be distributed. After all, in accordance to an article in 2022 by the Harvard School of Public Health without urgent intervention of over 1.2 million people in the US and Canada will die from an opioid overdose by the end of the decade. But this family wanted to sell it anyway because they don't care. And despite the bankruptcy they endured, the family still has billions of dollars. Forbes estimate that the family comprises of 40 members still worth about $10.8 billion. So don't worry, these rich people are fine. But the many people who suffered under the addictions caused by their recklessness are not. I'm gonna start in my usual fashion by choosing someone that may be familiar to all of us, such as Caligula. Roman Emperor Caligula ruled for only four years, from AD 37 to 41. When he first assumed power, he was a pretty all right guy. He allowed exiles to return to Rome, eliminated unpopular tax, and put in place some political reforms that citizens Supported. But in no time, he became notoriously deranged and sadistic. The best of both worlds. He forced a political rival to take their life, made senators run in front of his chariot for miles, threw spectators into the arena to be killed by animals, forced himself upon wives and daughters of senators, and he could not keep his hands off his sister Drusella. Once, when presiding over the sacrifice of a bull, instead of bringing the hammer down on the animal's cranium, Caligula deliberately did it to the priest's assistant. Some of his cruelties were more capricious and arbitrary in nature. He would order that the awnings providing shade for the crowds of public entertainment be pulled back at the hottest times of the day. And if he ran across a man with a thick head of hair, he'd have him seized on the spot and his scalp roughly shaven because Caligula was going bald. His reign came to an end when his own guards killed him, the first Roman emperor to die this way. Another recognizable face and name may be that of Bloody Mary, not the mirror one from the 90s sleepovers. I'm talking Mary from first of England, as in the first queen of England. She could have been remembered for that, but instead it's her attempts to restore Catholic only England using convert or die policy that she's remembered for. Lady Jane Grey, who Mary had put to death to gain the throne, was more likable to the public. Protestants detested Mary and feared England being reclaimed in the name of Catholicism. Mary promised not to force conversion and that her upcoming marriage to the Catholic Spanish king wouldn't sway her. Womp womp, bloody B word is a liar. A month into her ascension, Mary reaffirmed the papal jurisdiction over England and when the deal with Rome succeeded, the heresy act were reinstated, which allowed for the burning of heretics. In February of 1555, the Marian persecutions began. Sources vary, but in total, Mary I had almost 300 people executed, most of them burned at the stake. Most of them simply for the crime of being Protestant. Her reign was relatively short, lasting a little over five years. She died in 1558, either from ovarian cysts or cancer. Next up is the toll-taking Ptolemy Philopater, one of the Greek kings of the Hellenistic Egypt, a very obvious descendant of Alexander's pal Ptolemy. He was a 3rd century BCE pharaoh and a drunk hot mess. In true Egyptian fashion, he married his sister Arsenio and deified himself while he was still alive, promoting his family's association with Egyptian and Greek gods. In order to keep his throne secure, he did what any Ptolemy did best, kill every family member within grabbing distance. Ptolemy killed his mother, brother, and uncle with the assistance of a guy named Sobiesis, who was pals with a fellow named Agatholikes, whose sister Agatholikes Clea was banging Ptolemy. In addition to sneaking around with the sisters of his homies, which is not very for the boys of him, Ptolemy lounged around as if his chief concern were the idle pomp of royalty. He stopped paying attention to domestic and foreign affairs, devoting himself to shameful amours and senseless and constant drunkenness. He was compared to Dionysus, the god of drunkenness and tragedy. Neglecting his royal duties, Ptolemy even took up the pen writing a tragedy called Adonis. Unsurprisingly, it was under Ptolemy that Egypt's international presence began to wane. Next up is the 
Yu Song Emperor gone wrong. This teenage Chinese emperor only ruled for one year in the 5th century, but what a legacy he left. Liu Ziye was the eldest son of Emperor Xiao of Liu Song during the Southern and Northern dynasties, and he took over the throne as Emperor Qiafin when he was 15 years old, against the wishes of his father who had died, who'd wanted Liu's younger brother, Ziluan, to ascend to the throne next. Once it was his, Liu, out of deep resentment towards said father and brother, immediately forced his brother to take his own life and killed all his other siblings. The new emperor also slaughtered all of the officials who had worked for his dad and put his uncles under house arrest to avoid coups. While he's at it, he summoned his aunt to his palace to satisfy his uncommon bedroom desires and then killed his uncle when the man couldn't stand what happened to his wife. He tormented his own concubines, forced horrible situations with inanimate objects and animals, and he also had a very consensual reoccurring relation with his sister in the palace. When said sister complained it was unfair that Liu had so many concubines and she only had one husband, Liu selected several dozen handsome men to act as her concubines. But Liu's worst fear ends up being true. His uncles had plotted against him and one night almost a year to the day since he had taken the throne, Liu Ziye went to the pavilion of one of his parks at night and shot at ghosts a shaman told him were hanging around. Distracted by shooting at ghosts, he let his courtiers get close and kill him. You learn this story young, it's number 7, King John, aka the Magna Carta King, and one of the worst if not the worst King of England. John's offenses are almost too long to list. Even before he was king, the bugger was on some BS. When his older brother Richard the Lionheart was away on a crusade, John attempted to seize the throne by plotting with the King of France, Philip Augustus. Ironically, all those years later, when John is finally king, he starts his reign with the greatest dominion in Europe, England, large parts of Wales and Ireland, also Normandy, Brittany, Anjou, and Aquitaine. Yet within five years, he had lost all, almost all three continental territories to Philip Augustus. This loss of continental inheritance was an embarrassment and John was determined to win it back. Unfortunately, he was not competent at warfare and the attempts dragged on and drained the bank account. To quote Magna Carta.com to raise the massive armies and fleet this enterprise would require, he wrung unprecedented sums of money from England. Taxes were suddenly demanded on an almost annual basis, nobles were charged gargantuan sums to inherit their lands, and the lands of the church were seized and the Jews were imprisoned and tormented until they agreed to pay extra. John's reign saw the greatest financial exploitation of England since the Norman Conquest. In May of 1215, six months after the French whipped his butt, the people of England rebelled and seized London. With the capital held against him, the kings forced to negotiate and obliged to make concessions. The Magna Carta is signed. Then he had it annulled, and then everyone rebelled again, and then John died, and the barons were still rebelling. The end. Next up is William the Conqueror, and he's number six. Before we called him William the Conqueror, he was actually William the Bastard. Like something out of a movie, his nobleman father Robert came across his tanner mother washing clothes by the river and falls head over heels for her. As a result, the royal heir was not technically royal heir material, but don't let Robert or William hear you say that. Between the two, anyone who ever made fun of William's mother was killed and usually pretty brutally. An example is when the villagers of Alisson hung tanning hides in the trees to mock William's mother's status. William stormed the castle, captured 32 defenders, and had their hands and feet cut off. William, a duke far removed from royal lineage, didn't think too much about England until 1051, when the childless king Edward the Confessor made a truly bizarre decision. He chose William to be his heir. Then, seconds from death, in 1066, he revoked it. William decided, no, I'm getting what I was promised. However, England was in a full-blown crisis of succession for years until William defeated Harold II at the Battles of Hastings and became the new king of England. In wake of his victory, William ordered the harrying of the north. In order for the English population to understand its new state of affairs, he sent his men to the north to kill, unmask, and pillage stocks. This also made it easier to fulfill his promise of giving the land to his loyal followers. He then imposed new laws, raised taxes, and introduced harsh punishments against those who stepped out of line. The people of England were infuriated by William's new laws, and a series of revolts sprung up north of the country. In response, William and his armies attacked the northern villages, killing everyone in sight as well as the livestock and burning down barns. The lack of livestock led to starvation and disease for what rebels had survived, and the countryside started to reek of corpses. The total death toll, 10,000 people. Up the tower we go for number five, it's Richard III. Richard was never meant to be king, and the malign monarch only landed the job in 1483 because his brother, his brother Edward's children, were deemed too illegitimate for the role. With the support of the Duke of Buckingham, a great campaign promising to 
to improve royal court management and a stout disapproving of his brother's rampant public adultery, Richard seemed to have potential. But it's kinda hard to praise and look past the two nephews disappearing, however. In August of 1483, the supposed soon to be crowned King Edward and his younger brother, Richard of Shrewbury, were sent to the Tower of London to await Edward's alleged coronation. But his coronation never came, and one day they just disappear. The prince's uncle and would be king has long since been blamed for their disappearances and probable deaths. He had the most to gain, after all. Richard was also doing everything in his power to prevent the lineage going back to them in the first place, such as planning a marriage between Joanna of Portugal and Manuel, Duke of Beja. When that doesn't work, he tries offering up his niece Elizabeth, who at the time, rumors emerged that Richard was planning to marry himself. The room, This rumor more than possibly drove some to side with Richard's only remaining competition for the throne, Henry Tudor, the same man who defeats and kills Richard at the Battle of Bosworth in 1485. On to number 4, we have Siva de Polk the Accursed. Now, damn, that's a heavy name, but it's one well earned. I'll be more than honest, as usual, it's actually quite hard to judge if the medieval nobility of, of Kivan Ru were necessarily good or evil, as we know very little about them. And what we do know is word of mouth stories that survived for centuries before finally being chronicled. So, we've all played the kids' game telephone. I don't have to tell you how easily word of mouth stories can be converted and contorted. Siva Polk, the son of Vladimir the Grey, who baptized Rus to Christianity, certainly had the worst publicity possible documented. He's infamous for the death of his three brothers, Boris, Gleb, and Svivoslav. Siva Polk's reign was relatively short one, from 1015 to 1019, because brother he hadn't gotten to, Yaroslav the Wise, took action against him. Then Prince of Novogod, Yaroslav defeated his brother, causing him to flee to Poland, where his father-in-law was based. With his help, Siva Polk returned to defeat Yaroslav, causing him to flee back to the Novogod. It became a back and forth, taking turns driving each other away, and it was only in 1019 that Yaroslav won. Siva died at age 29, traveling back through Poland. Number 3 is Christian the Tyrant. His most notorious act was the Stockholm Bloodbath of 1520, when after a three day coronation feast, he beheaded 82 nobles in the Swedish capital after promising them amnesty in return for intel. Up until this point, everything had been going his way. He had reunited the Kalmar Union under his rule, taking control of trade in the Baltic Sea, and, and married the sister of Charles the Holy Roman Emperor, joining the powerful Habsburg family. But as said by history professor Lars Bilsgaard, Christian gained a lot of enemies in a very short time at the end of 1520. To quote, the bloodbath was a game changer. Partly it led to a rebellion in Sweden at the time when he didn't have any money left to pay for troops, partly it was because the Danish nobility began to fear that they would see the same fate and lose their heads. In Denmark, Christian II had carried through a modernization program, limiting the power of nobility and strengthening his power as king. And when has the upper class ever liked having their sense of entitlement towards power tampered with? When Sweden started to break loose from the Kalmar Union, the Danish nobility lost patience, forcing Christian from the throne, driving him into exile, and replacing him with his uncle. Not every ruler is ruling over a kingdom. Number two is John and the White Company. John Hawkwood led the White Company Knights Band that tormented the countryside of France, Italy, and Spain in the 14th century. We've done quite a few videos on this channel that explain how knights are kind of like labor or bodyguards for hire when there isn't some war or inquisition going on. Because medieval aristocrats like to disband their armies the moment they no longer need their services. During those times, the men would band up and ride out. As a result, hardened soldiers often found themselves at loose ends and many miles from their homelands. Since medieval armies fed and supplied themselves by pillaging farms and towns as they went, the mercenaries knew that was efficient, free, and easy for them to accomplish. So they continued in this practice. They roamed the countryside, robbing, violating people, and kidnapping random wealthy hostages for ransom. Of course, they were available for hire, but local landowners were more likely to pay them to simply go away. This is also why chivalry was invented, a code of behaviors and rules to govern these knights to stop their overall rampant and sociopathic behavior. Although Hawkwood, who in retirement would set himself up to be a respectable citizen in Florence, was known for his more insatiable greed than his brutality, and thrived in this time as a freelance knight, he was the leader of a band that carried out the Robert Geneva kill order in Senea. And when two of his men were fighting over who would get to take a nun, he simply pulled a King Solomon and cut her in half. Problem solved. It's last, but that doesn't mean it's the least. Number one is the Vipers of Milan. Bernardo and Galeazzo Visconti jointly ruled Lombardy in what's modern day Italy. And their joint rule really is a testament for how this family really did do everything together. Everything. They succeeded for throne when they killed their older brother by stabbing him and their uncle 
Marco Lucinio was killed by his wife, a plan she concocted while in the midst of a group intercourse get together on a riverboat. Good thing for her, one of her multiple male partners was Galezio because she could just pop her head up and tell him the plans right then and there, call that triple tasking. Bernardo, the more ferocious of the two when it came to things that weren't adulterous, such as being in a state of perpetual war with the Pope, who tried to issue a bull of excommunication against him and Bernardo simply responded by forcing the messenger to literally eat it, including the silk cord and the seals of lead that bound it. Bernardo's lusts by contrast were unbounded. Has he ever heard the expression about not blaming the messenger. And speaking of Bernardo, watch out Nick Cannon because while he wasn't a riverboat share sash kind of guy, the dozens upon dozens of illegitimate offspring by his various mistresses outnumbered even the 17 children he somehow fathered with his very long suffering wife. Seriously, check out this guy's wiki page, it's the craziest list I have ever seen. Their most demented action, however, was the Quest Amira together. It's a 40 day torment method handbook that they wrote that would be used and distributed for wide, wide public use usage, and it's the origin of plenty horrific methods that we saw used throughout the time. Kicking off the list at number 10, Heart of Glass. Alexandria of Bavaria, the royal who believed she had swallowed a grand piano made of glass. I'm not joking, yeah, she was a princess, so not technically a queen, but this is so insane that I had to kick off this list with it. The 23-year-old Bavarian princess was quite the scholar. She was known to enjoy literature, but she equally put energy into convincing those around her that she'd swallowed a piano made entirely of glass when she was a wee child. She grew up afraid that her inner piano would shatter. We have an inner demon, she has an inner Piano made of glass. So she would enter rooms slowly and sideways, I'm not kidding, to, you know, avoid cracking that personal piano problem. Just like King Charles VI, he thought he was going to break at any given moment. Saying you were made of glass was quite an uncommon delusion. The victims were more often than not royalty. They had glass. They watched this fancy material shatter in their hands all the time. No wonder, it probably scared them. There's actually a play on this glass delusion. It's called The Glass Piano by Alex Sobler. Quite recent too. Apparently, it's a blast. Check it out if you have the chance. We love that. Keep writing plays about glass pianos. This is insane. At number nine, Rosemary's Baby. Back in the days of old, it was very important to the monarchy to have a male heir. Many kings throughout history have been known to get very upset when they weren't given a son to inherit the throne, and they put a lot of pressure on their wives to give them a boy. Why? I don't know. Boys kind of stuck. Anyway, this probably drove a lot of people crazy, but there is at least one confirmed case of crazy baby fever from Maria Eleonora. She kept trying to have a baby, but when she finally got pregnant, everyone was hoping for a boy. Unfortunately, the odds weren't in her favor, and she gave birth to a little girl instead. People knew that Maria would get absolutely triggered upon learning of her baby's gender, so they kept it a secret from her as long as they could, but eventually they had to tell her, and Maria was pissed. She really went looking for that receipt to return that baby and get a refund or at least a store credit. When she found out the baby was a girl, the queen reacted by saying, quote, instead of a son, I am given a daughter, dark and ugly with a great nose and black eyes. Take her from me, I will not have such a monster, end quote. Like damn. Tell her how you really feel. After that, mysterious things started happening to this baby, like a wooden beam mysteriously falling into the baby's crib, and somehow accidentally falling down the stairs. Even the nurse once dropped the poor kid onto the stone floor. Like, I get it. You're disappointed, but that's still your kid, and a lot of people aren't given that privilege, so be grateful for your spawn. Number eight. Dirty talk. Going back to the 15th century to Queen Isabella of Spain, now it's not uncommon for queens to brag, be it about their wealth, status, their mans, you name it. But to brag that you've only bathed twice in your life, that's a bit odd. What's the deal with this? Okay, well back in 537 AD, Rome had 11 aqueducts that ran over about a thousand public fountains, okay? Over 900 bathhouses included. It was quite important, but when invading Goths cut them off, the Catholic Church literally had no idea how to fix the problem. So instead, they just told everybody that bathing was a sin only practiced by pagans. So at one point in history, you could have ran a bath, thrown in a bath bomb, relaxed for an hour, got out, and then immediately, you're a sinner. Worst of the worst, too. How dare you having a bath on 
Monday afternoon, you monster, you pagan monster. The Old Spice guy would have rocked their world. At number seven, Mother Knows Best. I think after hearing about these queens who've done some dark things to get their way, you would think that it's safe to say you don't mess with a woman and her plight for power. Unless you want to end up six feet under, that is. One Roman Empress, Julia Agrippina of Rome, was pretty spoiled already. She lived a lavish life, her husband was the emperor, and she had a family. But that just wasn't enough for her, and she wanted it all. Julia was quite ambitious, and she spent most of her early life trying to dethrone her predecessors. She believed that she and her son had a claim to the Roman throne by birthright, and so she bamboozled her way into royalty by tricking her uncle Claudius into changing Roman law so that they could get married. Ew. Suddenly though, after they got married and she became empress, Claudius died and most people think that Julia had something to do with it. That's likely the case. She and her son Nero went on to rule Rome from 49 to 54 CE. Julia stayed by her son's side for as long as she could so that she could hold on to her power, but eventually Nero got tired of his mother manipulating him and he had her forced out of power. Julia, as you can imagine, was furious because power was the one thing in the world that she desired most. and so she rallied a group of supporters to try and overthrow her son, but the plans backfired and she was expelled instead. Talk about ambition getting the best of you. Number 6, Ray Kroc. The man, the myth, the legend. Every time it's 3am and you've been hitting the sauce the same way Conor McGregor hits a punching bag, you dig into some golden crisp fries, savory fresh nuggets, and a belly warming burger to coat your tequila lined stomach. Am I right? You can thank Ray Kroc for that. Who is that you ask? Well, he's the founder of the McDonald's Corporation. Notice how I said the founder, not the creator or the owner. That's because while Ray Kroc was the CEO of the McDonald's Corporation, he was not its original owner and in a very hush hush scandal, stole the company from underneath the original owners, the McDonald's brothers. Another great movie, The Founder, which again I'm going to recommend, it's, it's a really good movie. It explains a lot. It almost makes me feel kind of guilty to eat a delicious two all beef patty, special sauce, lettuce, cheese, pickles, onions on a sesame seed bun. Or maybe not. Number five, Jordan Belfort. Steve Madden. Steve Madden. Oh, to be Jonah Hill struggling to make motor functions after throwing back too much donut sugar. You know what I mean? Maybe one day I'll get to be in the Scorsese movie. Call me, baby. I were cheap. Come on. Despite my dreams of being an A list movie star, the story behind that movie is what we're talking about. Or rather, the man in front of it all, Jordan Belfort. The Wolf of Wall Street. Or rather, just how I imagine every Wall Street guy is in a nutshell. Jordan Belfort was the leader of his own stockbroking company, who during the 90s would amass incalculable wealth due to many financial and stockbroking scams and schemes. This would fund a lifestyle that would make Ozzy Osbourne blush. Booze, substances that teachers would warn about you in school, and enough parties that would raise the fertility rates in whatever area they so happen to be in. Number 4, Parents. Tonight will be the night that I fall for you over again. Remember being 13? I know. Some of you are lucky that Facebook wasn't around when you were 13 because my generation now has archives of all the cringe things we used to post. Seriously, go back and look. It'll surprise you. That includes cringy song lyrics. However, when I think of rulers who are scandalous, sometimes I think of home. Not my home, but people in general. Now that we are all adults and we can all agree that our parents were right most of the time, but there's still a few times that they were wrong, weren't they? Mm hmm. Yeah. 100% wrong. I'm not upset. Who's upset, dude? I, dude, don't touch me. I'm fine, bro. I'm not upset. Mom, leave me alone. God. Number three, Napoleon Bonaparte, the Corsican ogre. Napoleon's story is one of giving an inch and taking a mile, but sometimes the world runs out of miles to give everyone, and then things get a little chaotic, and, and that's just, you don't want that. Napoleon was given opportunities and he took them, which is something we should all do. When you get an opportunity, you should seize it. Carpe diem, right? What we shouldn't do, however, is invade Europe multiple times and once we get the leg up, declare ourselves the first consul of France. Defeating the whole point of the previous revolution. It's kind of crazy actually. Limiting the rights of his people and in general causing a lot of issues for, for everyone. Other European powers were afraid that he might kick their butt, which was very likely. He was a pretty good military leader. Or even worse, give their people the idea of revolution. That's scary. However, after a cold winter in Russia and a bad trip to Waterloo, not Ontario, he was banished to an island where he wouldn't be able to bother anyone anymore. Au revoir, mon chéri. 
Number two, Joseph Stalin. Dude's down bad, maybe worse than a number one spot. The General Secretariat was not the original name for the leader of the USSR, but but when Joseph Jalan was in the position, well, he was quite literally the only one left standing. After all, his comrades and opponents took a nice vacation to a gulag. The title and name kind of had to change. A very bad man who had the mustache of Mario but the heart of Al Capone. Not so nice. Helped the Allies in World War II, but kind of wasn't liberating as much as we were, as they were so much replacing the Germans as occupiers. Not, not, not very good. A man who had no love for his son, who was captured as a POW and kind of just let him not come back home, he, he was unalived. A man who probably still haunts Eastern Europe today. Thank goodness we moved past Soviet aggression, right? Number one, mustache man. Does he need an introduction? Another bad dude. Another bad mustache. Germany rose from the ashes of World War I to be a powerful nation. Just, you know, they did a lot of horrible, awful things to, to get there. And then mustache man plunged the whole world into the worst conflict the planet has ever seen, and a lot of people were unalived. On paper, and to the German people, he was just the bee's knees, but he had enough scandal to write books about. Of course, in that style of government, you can't write books about him that way, or else you'd end up somewhere, somewhere rotten. It wouldn't be very good for your health, bro. It wouldn't be good. I talked to the chief, who was a general. He looked at the battle plans and said, that's not it. Number 10, girl troubles. Maria Eleonora of Brandenburg was a kind and loving mother, so long as you were a boy. Unfortunately for the royal mom, she had a great difficulty giving birth to a male heir. So when her daughter Christina was born, Maria proclaimed that she was given a dark and ugly daughter with black eyes. Eleonora often called her a monster. Oh yeah, and she did try to kill her on several occasions. Nothing says mental stability like blaming your daughter for being a daughter, and not more like a son. Because the male dominated patriarchy that is royal society has no effect on this, right? Number 9, Eyes on Irene. Irene was born into nobility and worked her way up the royal hierarchy. So why is Irene on this list? That's because she's probably the worst mother ever. When her son Constantine grew into adulthood, he made efforts to sideline his mother and challenge her position as a ruler. Irene, feeling some angry mom energy, retaliated in probably the worst way. In 797, Irene organized the capture of her son, and when he tried to escape, ordered that his eyes be gouged out. Constantine would later die of his injuries. Listen, I've had my fair share of minutes clocked out in the timeout corner. You can ask any one of my teachers, they'll tell you. And maybe even a few times today I should be put in the timeout corner too. But holy shit, mom, eye gouging? I, mean, that, I ain't that bad. Sheesh. Number eight, no cake for you. Marie Antoinette was the last queen of France, and for good reason. To make a long story short, she was part of the upper class nobility who benefited from the poor and overworked. When in a time of economic ruin, she still found a way to live a life of excess, while literally everyone else suffered. Spending all of France's money on completely ridiculous items, even by Lady Gaga standards, she jokingly became known as Madame Deficit. Eventually, she would be executed in the revolution. The expression, let them eat cake, was most likely not said by her or by anyone. But regardless if it was, it's a statement to show the complete disconnect and ignorance the nobility had when understanding just how bad things were for the working class. They most likely didn't care either. People were starving and putting heads on pikes. Do you really think they had time for cake, your highness? Oh, to be as beautiful and ignorant as an 18th century queen. Number seven. Lovers touch. Some couples flourish, others fizzle out. Some keep their privacy and others like to make out in the hallways, right in front of everyone. Yeah, you know the ones. It's always by a classroom you have to walk by, or it's by your locker. Joanna of Castile leans more towards awkward locker makeouts. It's speculated that she may have had some form of mental illness. After her mother fell ill, she was reported not to be eating or sleeping, which doesn't sound that bad actually. She was also a very envious person who oftentimes expressed her distaste for her husband's mistresses, reportedly attacking one on occasion, which again, doesn't sound that bad. And when her husband died of illness, she kept very close to the man's body and traveled over 600 kilometers with it, where he was to be buried, where she would often open the casket and embrace the cadaver and kiss him. Oh, okay, 
That's where the unholiness is, gotcha. I know medical knowledge wasn't great, but if your husband died of an illness, you couldn't seriously think that kissing him was a good idea. This is like the third royal I've come across that has a fixation on corpses. Sometimes you just gotta let the dead be dead, man. Now, onto Nero the Nutcase. He became the Roman Emperor when he was 17, the youngest ever at that time, and it's clear Nero got his Machiavellian inclinations from his mother, who ensured his place on the throne by marrying her weird old uncle and then killing him via poison. Nero's hedonism actually continually got the best of him. In fact, he sentenced or personally killed most of his close relatives. For example, Nero slept with and killed his mother, married and death sentenced one stepsister, death sentenced his other stepsister, forced himself upon and then killed his stepbrother. He kicked his wife to death, then met a young man who looked like her, so he had the guy's boy snipped, dressed him up to look like the dead wife, and married the guy. He married another random dude, this time Nero himself playing the bride, and Nero also told Seneca, THE Seneca, to F off and take his own life, which he did. And that's just the creepy lusty stuff. In 64 AD, a great fire struck Rome, taking out 75% of the city. Many Romans blamed Nero himself for the fire as a way to make room for a new castle, which he then built where half of Rome used to be. Even if he didn't start it, he did nothing to stop it, instead blaming Christians. Under his rule, thousands of Christians were starved to death, burned, torn by dogs, fed to lions, crucified, used as human torture and nailed to crosses. He was so bad that many of these Christians thought he was the Antichrist. Some regard her as a hero, but she was a through and through bigot. Isabella of Castile. There was supposed to be a little chance, little, that she would ever become a monarch of the Castiles, as she was super far removed from the direct royal lineage. Isabella is even promised to a commoner to end a rebellion. Thankfully for her, he dies before that happens. She was then wed to Ferdinand, the heir of the thrones of Castile and Aragon. And after the death of the king of Castile, Steel, the throne was given to Isabella, but there were some counterclaims and four years of battles before she is fully titled Queen of Castile. Her cruelty is recognized in the treatment of non Christians. Her kingdom's Muslims and especially Jewish people were the victims of a horrible mass slaying. Her actions led to the formation of the Spanish Inquisition, known for its extreme brutality and non Catholics, and the massive erasure of history, racial diversity, and culture worldwide. Isabella and Ferdinand then annexed the Kingdom of Grandana, the last Muslim kingdom in Spain, and the last piece to fall to the Spanish Reconquista. While some may see it as a liberation of Spain, for literally everyone else, this was the big G word, including the UN, if you look at their definition. Our next one is the formidable founder, King Leopold II, who founded the Congo Free State as his own private colony and went on to make a huge fortune from it by forcing the Congolese into heavy unpaid labor for ivory and rubber. This evil Belgian king was dubbed the Satan and Mammon in one person as he ran around kickstarting Europe's so called scramble for Africa in 1880s. He convinced the world that his violently ceased and lucratively priced land grab in the Congo was humanitarian, telling Euro and American powers he was the only in Africa to save the poor people from the Arab people and bring Christianity to a dark continent. Effin liar! Instead, he stole about 1.1 billion to fund his lavish lifestyle and fund an array of uncomfortably young girlfriends, one of which he married when he was 74 and then died five days later. And the Congo? He turned into a massive labor force. Millions end up suffering from starvation, the birth rate dropped as men and women were separated, and tens of thousands are killed in failed rebellions. Demographers estimate that from 1880 to 1920, the population population fell by 50%. This forced labor system was then copied by French, German, and Portuguese officials. He called himself Laglium Dei, aka the Scourge of God. For Roman historian Jordanes, he was a man born into the world to shake the nations. For the Romans themselves, he was a savage destroyer, of whom it was said that the grass never grew on the spot where his horse had trod. Who was this man? Attilia of the Huns. This ruthless king of the nomadic Asiatic race killed his brother to take the throne before embarking on a campaign of slaughter and pillage through a hundred cities, which took him to the gates of Constantinople, Troyes and Gaul, and even Rome itself, threatening their empire into paying them off once a year to not be invaded by them. The Huns were interested in grabbing people, animals, loot, and land. They destroyed food sources for their enemies, and nobody was safe from their wrath, including women, elderly, priests, monks, and nuns. When marauding through Eastern Europe one day, Attila and his forces wiped 70 cities off the map. The Hun's fighters were known to make blood-curdling screams 
screams and other noises while attacking their victims on horseback, and their favorite methods of death were impalement and crucifixion. Meeting time with our mad queen of Madagascar. Rana Valona makes it to the throne when her father warns the king of the United Tribes that someone was planning an attempt on his life. Grateful for the warning, he adopts Rana into his court one day to be the wife of his son, Prince Radama. Fast forward, the king passes in 1810 and the Prince Radama takes the throne with Rana as his queen. He allowed for an invasion on the land, especially by British missionaries who built buildings of their own and helped develop written language and forced Christian conversion naturally. These modernized ideas displeased Rana, so when her husband died and she wanted the throne, she figured, hey, these guys are kind of stupid. And by just claiming that God said she should be the queen, everyone dropped what they were doing and let her ascend to the throne. Just like that. She expelled any and all Europeans immediately and canceled trade deals with Britain and France. After one successful battle against an invasion, she stuck the missionaries' heads on spikes along the shoreline to really get the message across. She replaced the trial by jury with trial by ordeal, and those found guilty alongside with other criminals and prisoners are sold to Europeans. In 1845, Rana ordered 50,000 of her subjects to go on a buffalo hunt. With a small amount of supplies and having to build a road on their way to ease the traffic, as per her order. Only 10,000 of them returned, and they never caught any buffalo. Consequently, Rana's reign brought down the nation's population from 5 million to around 2.5 million by the end of her rule. On August 16th of 1861, Rana died at the age of 79 during her sleep in the palace. People mourned her death in great honor for approximately 9 months. And to take the cake is the terrifying Timur. Also known as Tamerlane, this Mongol Turkic conqueror was born in 1330. Timur became a criminal early in life, stealing goods and animals from travelers, later working as a mercenary. As a conqueror, he killed for loot, personal glory, and the dark joy that twisted effed up people get from inflicting pain on others. He was the worst of the least recognized psychopaths in history, and his story provides a lesson and a warning for all of humanity. And he has a long list of horrible deeds. Dude could probably have his own top 10 video, I swear. Like the invasion of Ifshafan, which went well, and the city surrendered, but some teenage idiots decided they didn't like that and they had never done that before, so they killed a couple of Timur's men. So Timur had a city of 70,000 to about 100,000 people beheaded in response. From this moment onwards, skull towers became his operandi, and it was proven in Baghdad when 90,000 skulls were erected into 120 stinking towers throughout the city. In present day Afghanistan, Timur ordered the construction of a tower to be made out of live men, each stacked on each other then cemented together with bricks and mortar. And as much as it's relevant for atrocities, talking about Damascus would make me sick, so let's just say his crimes in there earned him the status as an official enemy of Islam from the Muslim leaders at the time, and he was a self-proclaimed Muslim guy. This guy quite literally put the once great Sultan of the Ottoman Empire into a footstool that he would climb on to get onto his horses, and that's how we got the name for the Ottoman, the stupid little furniture piece that's impossible to place in your living room correctly. In the end, Timur's armies are estimated to have killed 17 million people, approximately 5% of the world population at the time. Number 10, Richard Nixon. I am not a crook. <laughs> yes. Famous words from the man who might have possibly been a crook. I'm okay, he was. Richard Nixon, the 37th President of the United States of America. A time in America when a lot of history was unfolding. Seriously, crazy times. Speaking of unfolded, just like the documents regarding the Watergate scandal, after successfully ending the American involvement in the Vietnam War, Shortly after escalating it, Nixon found himself in some hot water. Break-ins at the Democratic Committee were not a presidential look. Naturally, he denied all claims of his involvement and folks believed him. How could they not? He's the president. Not too long after, some tapes would reveal his wrongdoings and shortly after that, he became the only president to resign office. Number 9, Jimmy Hoffa. James Riddle Hoffa. If you haven't seen the movie The Irishman, go see it. Seriously, fantastic movie. Like in the movie, most people my age and younger have no idea what a teamster is or who the heck Jimmy Hoffa was. In a nutshell, he was president of the Teamster Union, which basically is just a union for truck drivers and transportation. And at the time, Mr. Jimmy Hoffa had a lot of uh, mafia connections. Jimmy Hoffa would loan money out to anyone considered to be a wise guy so they could develop the very mob-controlled Las Vegas. 
With interest, of course. You never loan without interest. Scam of the century, really. Of course, Jimmy denied all claims even after serving time in the slammer for fraud. If that didn't make him look guilty, then mysteriously disappearing after 1975 sure did. Nobody knows exactly what happened to poor Jimmy, but one thing is for sure. He didn't just go for a walk and never come back. You know what I'm saying? Number 8. Roosevelt Younger folks might not know this name, but this is the only US president to serve more than two terms. Four terms, actually. Double, double trouble. A tradition put in place by George Washington when he declined his third term. Well, in 1940, this wasn't a law or written in the Constitution. More of just something that noble men honoring a tradition. Roosevelt ran for re-election and won, giving his good work on recovering from the Great Depression. Surely another global war would look good underneath him, right? Sure. Oh, and you know, they may have hid how sick he really was from polio. Yeah, the president had polio. Because you can't have a leader who looks weak, even though I'd argue if he did that, while having polio, that would make him look stronger than the average president, but yeah, what do I know, we'll go with that. He got elected again to see out World War II, however, he would pass away before he saw its end. And polio, man, that's a bad one, dude. That one cripples you up. That's not a good one, brother. That's a bad one. Oof. Number seven, Mrs. Meanie. Okay, this one's for me, alright? Or for all the people that had one teacher like this that used just to drive you insane. Naturally, I ain't gonna name names cause just because I ain't, but we'll call her Mrs. Meany. Mrs. Meany, for some reason, had it out for me back in school more than any other teacher that I knew. Yes, I was loud. I was the class clown. Strangely enough, I was voted for that in the yearbook. Is anyone surprised though? I'm, I'm not, no, not really. But this class, I was good. I swear I was. She constantly challenged me and would start arguments in the middle of class in front of all my friends. I didn't want to fight. I just wanted to get the day over with. What's scandalous, you may ask, about all this? Well, after talking to a few of my favorite teachers, they all said that Mrs. Meany was kind of mean to them too. See? I wasn't wrong. They never said anything as heinous about her as us kids did, but you know, my point stands. In a PG-13 rating, let me know if you guys had any teachers that you couldn't stand or just had it out for you in the comments below. I'm curious, I wanna know. No more mean teachers. Number six, we are family. The last queen of Madagascar. Queen Rana Valona was one of the worst. She was born in 1788 and she ruled over the kingdom for 33 years. She was so cruel and violent that she would often choose violence first in order to preserve independence over the island. She's known as the most ruthless queen in history. After the death of her husband, she just went mad with that new power. In the late 1700s, her king brought peace to the land, but of course there were traditionalists who opposed him. The king's uncle at one point tried to take Take him out, but a local warned the king. That king repaid the local by adopting his daughter, Rana Valona, to marry his son, Prince Radama. Now, when her prince was alive, they didn't get along at all. And then come 1810, the king passed away, giving Ranalova the promotion of a lifetime. It's also theorized that she poisoned him too, so that's horrible. Ranalova kept away the advances of the French and the British and left bodies of those who tried to attack out for display on the beach. Lovely, like Bobbleheads. In 1845, Queen Rana Valona ordered 50,000 subjects to build roads across the jungle for four months straight for this massive buffalo hunt. Well, 10,000 of those poor souls died of starvation and exhaustion, and also, not one buffalo was hunted, nor seen. Great plan. At number five, Queen Batman. Batman, he is justice. We know this. Well, long before Batman, there was a queen who sought vengeance and she did it in the most brutal way. Olga of Kiev became queen regent in 945 CE after her husband was killed because her son was just too young to rule yet. Olga knew that once her son was old enough to be crowned king, her power would be taken away, so she had to do the most that she could with her power while it still lasted, and so she used her powers as monarch to seek justice for her husband's death. She was able to get her husband's killers captured and killed using scolding water, but she soon developed a thirst for suffering apparently and she just kept on going after people. She would not rest until everyone associated with the people who killed her husband were all eliminated. So if you ever breathe in the general vicinity of the guy who off her hubby, you could kiss your life goodbye. Olga took hundreds of people out of the tribe that her killers were from, she devised a plan to bury their tribe's leaders alive, and she even came up with a plan to set fire to their entire village. It is said that Olga may have locked the tribe's leaders in a bathhouse and burned it down, but we don't know for sure. All we know is that she definitely was not okay. Number four, no crust. 
This next one, honestly, I stand by. I see no wrong here. Queen Elizabeth II, still rocking to this day. She's been known for a few funny, quirky queen things. Like one of my favorites, for example, she has somebody on payroll who breaks in new shoes for the queen. Every time I buy Vans, my ankle always does that little foot rub. If only I were a queen, damn it. But we're talking about unusual things here. And one of the weirdest things I've ever heard is that the queen has refused crust on her sandwiches. This has been a no-go for about 150 years. It's not recent at all. You might be thinking, oh, maybe she's old. She can't chew her jawbones. Nope way back. This goes way back for no reason. Right around the time of Queen Victoria and her husband Albert. They viewed anything square shaped as bad luck because it looked like a coffin. I've never thought about death while eating grilled cheese, but now I definitely will. Thank you. This must be a pretty scary job, cutting the crust off the queen's bread. My hands would be shaking the entire time. Also, diagonal or down the middle? Let us know. There's only one right answer. I number three, evil empress. This next empress is pretty similar to Olga of Kiev, whom I talked about earlier. Empress Wu Zetan also had a thirst for blood and suffering, but not towards people who have necessarily wronged her. You see, when she came into power, she was determined to keep that power by any means necessary. So she had all of her rivals killed. So anyone who could possibly overthrow her or come for her seat on the throne was eliminated. The empress ordered the execution of the previous empress, as well as members of her own family, including her own newborn daughter. She didn't want to risk anyone taking away her power, including her own offspring apparently. She didn't hold back on the methods of eliminating her rivals either. Yeah sure, she could have just done a one-two stabby stabby and called it a day, but that's no fun. Instead, she had people poisoned, strangled, mutilated, or even burned or boiled alive. Good soup. Eventually, she retired from her part-time job of sending people back to their maker and started spending more time with her lovers and getting addicted to aphrodisiacs. People weren't quick to forget about all that bloodshed though, and so to get back at her, they had all of her lovers killed and the empress was exiled. She got a little too greedy and karma came back with a vengeance. Number two, Ice Palace. If you're a fan of the film Frozen, this next one is gonna get you jazzed right up. Anna Ivanova, the Empress of Russia from 1730 to 1740. Okay, so in celebration over their victory with the Ottoman Empire, Anna gave the order to build an ice house, this massive ice palace. Best place to cool down if you ask me, I'll leave. This ice palace was pretty impressive. If I was there, I would 100% lick the walls. Obviously, someone definitely did, you know that for a fact. 20 meters by 50 meters, and even more impressive, there were ice trees and ice birds sculpted inside. How magical is that? Anna arranged this marriage with a prince and one of her maids. Now, they didn't know each other, they were forced to ride an elephant, and all the guests were dressed up like clowns. Yep, that's all valid, that's all accurate. You heard me. You may be thinking, wait a minute, Taylor, an ice palace in Russia, was that maybe Cold? Yeah, it was an absolute nightmare. Anna made the guest party all night, freezing cold. They all got sick, dressed like clowns. I went to an ice hotel in Quebec once. Spoiler alert, it's cold and boring. There, I just saved you $70. You're welcome. And finally, at number one, Gladiator Games and Chill. If you didn't ever have to go to work and you could just lounge around all day, what would you do with your time? Really, anything could be possible. You could be like the Bruno Mars lazy song. Well, there's one empress from back in ancient Rome who occupied her time with the company of others. Apparently, Empress Valeria Messalina was famous for her exploits. Since she was empress and she had all this time and money and no one to tell her no, she took full advantage of that and bought a house, turned it into a brothel, and made that her side hustle. A lot like Littlefinger from Game of Thrones. Though she had a collection of women who worked there, she also was known to to invite upper class ladies to participate in the nightly escapades as well. And don't think that Valeria did jump in as well. She was considered to be quite something in the sack. In the wise words of Ludacris and Little John, she was a lady in the streets, but a freak in the bed. <laughs> The Empress was known to be such a hardcore participant that she would win games where they would compete to sleep with the most men in one night. One time she won the round after being with 25 men. One night. She did the absolute most, but at least she was having fun. Steal for number 10. I mean, if we're gonna defend Pedro the Cruel, he was obliged to defend his throne against his father's uh, 10 illegitimate sons. On the other hand, they wouldn't have had so much more support from the people than the king himself if Pedro hadn't outraged his people with arbitrary killings, drama, and rules, as well as the pretty cheap treatment of his wife Blanche, the sister of the king of France. His father, Alfonso, had ditched his wife, Pedro's mom, Maria of Portugal, 
for his mistress once Maria had produced their son. Exiled away from court, Pedro grew up listening to his mother's hatred for his father, yet when he took the throne, he did an almost exact rinse and repeat. Pedro publicly marries Blanche, despite already having secretly wed one of his mistresses, and he abandoned and imprisoned her very shortly after. Basically, if someone looked sideways at him, Pedro had them killed. He inaugurated his reign in 1350 by killing supporters of his half brothers, and also had his father's mistress killed for his mother. He was said to have killed a man for looking at him wrong way, and burned a woman alive for rejecting his advances. Pedro's new son-in-law, Edward the Black, got blessed with a large gem that he had obtained by robbing and killing a guest in his own house. He also put a hit out on Blanche in the end, and she died via crossbow to the eye. And of course, needless to say, Pedro killed as many of his own half brothers as he could get his hands on, primarily through various forms of deceit. On to number 9, which is Charles of Navarre, who can also be called the Double Crosser's Double Crosser. See, Charles came from a branch of French royalty that had renounced its claim to the throne, but clearly Charles did not share that sentiment. He is crowned in 1349 and was driven by revenge and a disproportionate sense of entitlement, quickly earning himself the nickname Charles the Bad as he attempted to expend Navarre's territory into France and Spain via schemes, plot, and deception. Ultimately, he failed and ended up marginalized and alone. In the words of historian Barbara Touchman, Charles was volatile, intelligent, charming, violent, cunning as a fox, ambitious as Lucifer, and more truly than Byron, mad, bad, and dangerous to know. His only constancy was hate. One of Charles's first targets was King Jean II's favorite minister, whom he had killed by thugs. Over the next three decades of the Hundred Year War, as France contested with England for control over territory on the continent, Charles changed sides so quickly and so often that it made everyone's head spin, and making contradictory deals with each side of a conflict at the same time. He attempted one coup and twice tried to poison the king in like a real life Game of Thrones fashion. And trust me, there's a lot of old nobility stories like this one, so if you're interested in hearing more of them, I recommend you take a moment to subscribe to The Hive. Edward III is on our countdown at number 8, and he pulled a total King David. He sent his homie Earls of Salisbury to go fight wars in foreign countries so he could go try to bang the Earl's wife on the sly. However, the Countess refused the King's slick idea, but Edward didn't accept that answer and returned after dark. He tells the valets to quote, nothing must interfere with what he was going to do on pain of death. Contemporary accounts from the time, of which there are five parts, detail how the Countess was left in an absolutely horrific state. And by the time her husband returns, she's fallen into a deep depression and admits to her husband what has happened. The Earl goes into a blind rage, understandably, and goes straight to Edward, who was holding court at the time. In front of dozens of witnesses, the Earl confronts his once friend, saying, You have villainously dishonored me and thrown me in the dung, and continues to tell Edward that his actions were so disgusting and inhuman that he could no longer live in the same country with the monstrous king and then just left England forever. As for the Countess, Alice, all we know of her. Her fate is that the Earl made sure she had an independent income and was returned to her family's care before he left. At number six, apple of his eye. I feel like this queen I'm about to tell you about needs to have her own movie made about her or something because the things she did for power were almost unbelievable. I would say that I would want to be her when I grow up, but she's kind of responsible for the deaths of a lot of people, and that's not really something I'm striving for, you know? But she did have a lot of determination. I will give her that. Isabella was married to King Edward II of England, and though she was quite the catch, Isabella wasn't really all that jazzed about him. She was like, meh, I guess I'll be your wife, even though back then she really wouldn't have a choice in the matter anyway. Anyways, after 10 years of marriage and the birth of an heir, things seemed to be relatively okay between the king and queen. That is, until the king started getting all buddy buddy with his friend Hugh Dispenser, who was a much hated noble. Very hated. Hated numero uno. Isabella didn't like the bromance that was forming and she was like, uh, no, the only person who gets the king's attention is me. So she rallied the support of the other nobles, banished the Dispenser family, burned their castles to the ground, claimed their possessions, and killed anyone who supported the disgraced family. After all of that went down, she took refuge in the Tower of London, where she met a prisoner whom she smuggled to France. Then she got her husband to bring their son to France. And from there, with the support of the nobles and the common people, she was able to defeat her husband and the 
the Dispensers, and became Queen Regent until her son Edward III came of age to become king. After all of that, she finally got her way. I hope she slept well that night because she did the most. Number five, Rebel Princess. Princess Leia wasn't the only rebel, okay? Princess Margaret partied with rock stars during the 60s. The Queen's younger sister was known as the Rebel Princess. She was seen for years and years as this, well, bad. She passed away in 2002, but even to this day, we're trying to piece together her love life. Pablo Picasso actually wanted to marry her at one point. How fun is that? Also, side note, I didn't realize how recent Pablo Picasso died. That was alarming to find out. Guess my whole life's a lie. Her wedding was the first to be aired on TV. That's quite a big deal. The first televised royal wedding took place on May 6, 1960. In 1968, just eight years after, word had spread that the princess had an affair at a nightclub with pianist Robin Douglas Home, who only a year and a half later took his own life. Adds a lot of mystery there. Then come 1973, the paparazzi got photos of her with a landscape gardener on her private island. One of the more unusual facts surrounding Princess Margaret was that she was cremated, believe it or not. She had chosen to break tradition so that her ashes could be shared in the same tomb as her father. How sweet is that? These acts are unusual when it comes to royalty, but Margaret also supported more than 80 charity organizations. But even then, media still focused on her love life. Classic. Keep it up. At number four, Warrior Queen. Let's talk about Queen Rainy Lakshmi Bai and how she became known as India's Joan of Arc. Rainy was a fighter her whole life. She was raised to be a warrior and was taught how to fight. She even shared her skills with other women, teaching them the same fighting skills at a young age. She was married off to a much older man and she had a child, but she lost them both pretty early on. In need of an heir, she adopted a son and served as queen regent, but soon a growing conflict started causing a lot of tension between the British East Indian Company and her people. The young queen, at just 22 years old, wanted to drive British forces out of her land, and so she organized a revolt that turned bloody very quickly. She ordered the execution of literally every British person in the region. So Bobby from down the street, dead. Mary from around the block, goner. Freddie and Harriet, the kids of that guy that you know who bought shoes off your brother, bye bye. Gone. Rainy killed every man, woman, and child in the area. But it still wasn't enough to win against the British. The Queen died on the battlefield, and the British ended up winning the battle, and the kingdom fell to the enemy forces. This Queen was one of the bravest and most determined women in history, and she's still remembered as a hero. Number three, Chelonis. The reason we look at princesses like Margaret and say she was a rebel is because most of the time these marriages are chosen. Well, rather, women are forced to marry some gross fat dudes. And while he's cheating and eating lobster, the wife has to have his kids and be dutiful. So for the Spartan princess from the third century, she too was forced to marry Cleonymus, this older, horrible man. He was so horrible that he wasn't even allowed to have his father's throne. That's how bad he was. He was in the family and still they're like, no. So Chelones thought, this guy sucks, the system sucks, I'm gonna go talk to the much more pleasant Architatus, son of King Eris the first. Around 272 BC, both these guys, both her lovers, went to war with each other. Mm, drama. How about the tea on that? Chelonis was preparing to hang herself in case her husband won. That's horrible. Now, luckily, he lost, therefore the princess this time around did really live happily ever after with her other man. That's like an R-rated version of Shrek 2, what I just said. I can't believe people had to go through this in real life. That's horrible. At number two, toxic cosmetics. The price of beauty is pretty steep. These days, people spend hundreds and hundreds of dollars on makeup to make themselves feel beautiful. But back in the day, makeup not only cost a pretty penny, but it also cost some serious health concerns. Cosmetics were made of a lot of questionable ingredients that you probably wouldn't find in today's products, but for people like Queen Elizabeth I, she didn't care what she was putting on her skin, so long as she not only looked like a snack, but the whole damn meal. Yeah. Elizabeth had pitting in her skin from when she contracted smallpox at the age of 29, and back then, having blemished skin was a sign that God was a little cheesed with you, or that you were having some wild thoughts like thinking about the sexy time uwu. It was thought that these thoughts bubbled up from your no-no square up to your face and showed everyone that you were sinning. Anyways, to cover up the blemishes, Elizabeth wore a lot of makeup, like her version of foundation, but the ingredients were really just making things worse and not better. The foundation was made with a tincture of white lead ore, vinegar, and sometimes arsenic, hydroxide, and carbonate. To add some color back to her face after applying this pasty white mask, she powdered cinnabar to her lips and cheeks, but this was pretty dangerous because it contained mercury. She did this every day, and as you can imagine, it wasn't good for her health at all. Imagine absorbing all of those chemicals through your face on a daily basis. Not cute. And finally, number one. 
Are you not entertained? Back in the late 1800s, the name Clara Ward would stir up a conversation. She was famous, really famous, for all the wrong reasons, of course. All it took was her bumping into a European royal and... Bob's your uncle. Since birth, Clara was born into money. She didn't even need a royal husband. She was born into a wealthy industrialist family. She would sometimes visit the family mills, you know, to make it look good and kind of be like, hey, how's everyone doing? Whatever, just casual visit. But on this one casual visit, she crossed paths with the Prince of Caraman Chime. He was there for trade, but when he left, he brought back a wife. Carry on, also, meet my wife. Here she is. People were freaking out, obviously. A royal marrying a common American girl. Wow, how could you? She was the talk of the town. Unlike Meghan Markle, Clara loved to show off with her newfound wealth. Some loved her and her image, but others not so much. The marriage only lasted six years. Clara eloped with a Hungarian musician. Then after her divorce, she had to model to make a living rather than showing off for clout. At number 10, kleptomania. If you were a queen, then you would think that you had enough money to just buy whatever your little heart desired. Though that may be true, there was at least one famous queen who just straight up stole things just because she could. Queen Mary, Queen Elizabeth's grandmother, was quite the kleptomaniac, and no matter how hard people tried to avoid having their things stolen by her, it just never worked. When the queen would visit someone's house, she would walk around looking at whatever knickknacks you had lying around, and when she found something that she liked, she would stand there and just sigh super loudly to get someone's attention. Much like how my dog used to sigh dramatically when he wanted food. Anyways, usually when someone heard the sigh, they knew that this was a sign that the queen wanted whatever she was gazing upon. Sometimes the homeowner would just give whatever it was to the queen as a gift, gift. But if it was something that they weren't willing to part with, then she would either try to buy it off them or just straight up take it when no one was looking. This became such a big problem that people started hiding their prized possessions before hosting the queen in their home, but she eventually caught on to this strategy, so she just started showing up uninvited. She could not rest until she owned pretty much everything in the kingdom. Number nine, no time to dine. If I'm eating, don't acknowledge me as a human being. I sound like a pug when I eat, okay? I don't waste any time. I love food, okay? It's business. Now, if you're a queen and you eat fast, well, everybody else has to eat fast as well. This began back in Queen Victoria's time. The queen loved to feast and she didn't waste any time at all. Like, it's really fast. The way the royal family works is that when the queen is done that course or that meal, you're also done. So when Queen Victoria would smash an entire seven course meal in 30 minutes, which apparently she could do easily, you'd be blowing on your soup still and Queen Victoria would already be telling everybody to pack it up. That's stressful. All because she could eat lots of food in a short amount of time. Also, once the queen gave a toast, you couldn't even speak. Also, once the queen placed her cutlery on the table, regardless of where you were during that course, everybody's plate would then be taken away at the same time. And the next one would then come in. I would just put my food in my pockets, you know? Screw it. It's almost like when you go to all you can eat sushi and you have like some sushi left over, you don't want to waste it. You're like, you know what? I'm not paying that bill. At number eight, cross-dressing. Empress Elizabeth was quite the character, I guess you could say. Since she was a monarch, she could do whatever she wanted, and that is exactly what she did. You see, she was quite into fashion, more specifically, men's fashion. The Empress believed that she just had legs for days, like Naomi Campbell, and she wanted to show them off to the world, but the only problem with that was the fact that back then, pants were reserved for men, and so since she wore dresses all the time, no one got to see her godly legs. Well, to combat that, Elizabeth came up with a solution. She was known to hold huge parties where everyone had to cross-dress. She only did this so that it would give her an excuse to wear pants. And I mean, she could have if she just wanted to wear them on a regular day, but she didn't want to be the only woman in men's clothing, so she made everyone else dress up too. At these parties, no one looked good or really enjoyed themselves for that matter. Women complained that the men's clothing they wore to these parties were unflattering, and the men were just all over the place because they didn't know how to maneuver a hoop skirt. The only person really having a fun time was Empress Elizabeth, but I guess that was really the whole point. Number seven, check on the dead. Funerals are pretty expensive, especially a royal one at that. It takes a lot of power to dig up and then carry these massive caskets around, which back in the day was even more exhausting. Joanna of Castile was born in 1479. Her marriage to the Duke of Austria was arranged, but she was very much in love, maybe a bit too much, hear me out. When her husband met his fate in 1506 due to typhoid fever, Joanna would have his tomb unearthed and then opened over and over again, just so she could make sure that he was still 
there. Now, of course, I feel bad for the queen here. She was clearly not coping with his death well, but to have his tomb or casket or coffin, whatever you want to call it, to have it opened and closed over and over and then dug up and then put back in the ground, she would make people carry his body around everywhere she went. That's heavy. That is so much work, even keeping it under her bed sometimes. Ugh, I got goosebumps just saying that. That's pretty creepy. Ashes, I could understand. That's like a one-man job to carry that around. But a thousand-pound royal coffin that you have to carry 30 city blocks? My back already hurts thinking of that. No thank you. I quit. Number six. Who are you going to call? Queen Maria I of Portugal might have actually been insane. And no, not like, come on down to my local car dealership, these prices are insane. More like the Joker on a magic white powder that shan't be named just in case. I don't want to make YouTube big angie. She was known for ranting and raving, screaming that she had been damned. Perhaps it was Phantoms of the Night demonizing the poor soul. In attempts to cure her madness, such advanced scientific treatments like bloodletting and enemas were tried in order to cure her. The enema kind of makes sense. Maybe she's a little blocked up. It happens. I don't know. There were other attempts to cure her of her madness, but nothing seemed to work. While her first years in power were good, no one was ready for what they got afterwards. Hi, yes, uh, I'm calling from the royal court. We think the queen needs an exorcism. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we tried that. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, we tried that too. Yes, and we did try the uh, tried and true method of anima, yes. How soon can you get here? Oh, okay, perfect. Yep. Yes, I am available between the hours of 8 to 5. Mm-hmm. Number 5. A2 Brute. Agrippina of Rome was like many mothers, in the sense that she would do anything for her kids. I'm sure every mom at home watching would scheme and slaughter their way through Roman nobility in order for her son to become emperor, right? I mean, come on, it's for the family after all. She only did it a few times, and sees the wealth of nobles which further solidified her powerful position. And her son, her beautiful baby boy Nero. How did the young lad return the favor of all this bloodthirst and treachery? Like mother, like son. Chose to fatally remove her of her power. What a nice family story right there. My mom usually just makes turkey with the stuffing, but maybe I can ask for the Roman throne this Christmas. Mom! Number four, revenge. Boudicca was the wife of a man who had spent his time serving the Roman Empire. So when a deal was altered Darth Vader style by the Romans over what would happen to her husband's kingdom, she was pissed. Karen pissed. To be fair, she did have a point. They did unsavory and unholy things to her and her daughters. Plus, the Romans totally lied about not annexing their kingdom. Okay, so now it was time for some revenge. She gathered all the people she could and went on the attack. The Romans surprisingly did not fare that well. Boudicca was having such good luck she decided to burn London down. Of course, no civilians were harmed in the process. <laughs> I'm just kidding, a lot of people probably didn't do too well as humans can't live in fire. Sure, she was owed some revenge, but burning down a whole city, that's a lot. The Romans did eventually catch up, and she was forced to drink poison in order to avoid capture. She is remembered as somewhat of a hero to some. Number 3. Girl Power Tamar of Georgia was a woman who didn't take kindly to men questioning the rule of a woman. As you would wind up dead. She is, no she is noted for having a hand in the Golden Age of Georgia. Funny enough, she was made a saint even though she vanquished all the orthodox clergymen at the time, for also questioning her rule. Her husband aided in conquering more land, but when he couldn't keep it in his pants, she banished him and remarried. You go girl, you commit acts of unholiness and stand up for yourself. Number 2. Serial Killer? Daria Saltkova was not necessarily a queen, but she was Russian nobility. She had strong connections with the royal court and other Russian nobility. She was also very unholy. Now, Maybe you can blame it on her being widowed. Maybe she's just crazy. But her actions were sadistic. She's noted for having severely tormented her serfs and would straight up just kill them, with numbers reaching at least 138. At first, complaints about family members disappearing after working for her royal nightmare were ignored. She was just too powerful and connected. Eventually, a petition was put together and shown to Catherine the Great, where it was decided Daria would be tried publicly. She spent one hour in a public space in Moscow where people scorned her for her crimes. She was then sentenced to prison where the rest of her days were spent. She was also at times compared to Elizabeth Bathory, who committed similar non-nightmare inducing crimes. Just kidding, they were an absolute nightmare. Number 1. Her Royalness Queen Elizabeth II Queen Elizabeth II may be the modern Queen of England, but that does not make her free of controversy and unholiness. 
If you are to believe in conspiracy theories, then perhaps old Blighty had a hand in a few things that to a normal person would be considered immoral. The death of Princess Diana immediately comes to mind, as there is some evidence to suggest the family is behind it, and her being the queen and all, it's easy to make the connection. But perhaps the most unholy crime ever committed, apparently the queen likes her sandwiches with the crust cut off. Imagine all the extra time needed to trim the crust off every sandwich. I want to talk to HR just thinking about all the extra work. But maybe you can cut the crust off of mine? Um, don't tell anyone though. Kicking off the list at number 10, the Empress of Austria. The saying wrong place at the wrong time couldn't be used more in this case. Empress Elizabeth of Austria, she was sadly taken out by somebody who just wanted to attack a royal. He didn't have anything against Elizabeth per se, this man was an Italian anarchist named Luigi Luceni, and that fateful day, September 10th, 1898, he took the Empress's life. In his own admission, Luigi stated that he had nothing against the Empress on a personal level at all. See, so what had happened was he intended on taking the life of the Duke of Orleans, but when Luigi arrived a little too late in Geneva, the opportunity to do so had passed. He looked at a local newspaper, saw Elizabeth, and found out where she was staying, and he waited for her to leave that hotel. That's how easy it was. People are so creepy. Keep an eye open. If you're a queen, keep your eyes open. This is scary. Number nine. Royal curse. The remains of Polish queens and kings were discovered back in April 1931 in a crypt in Vilnius. Polish researchers didn't even know what they were in for. I mean, a storm had flooded a cathedral and they threw down sandbags to preserve the area, but on the night of April 25th, they had followed the water into this lost chamber that held the remains of Polish kings and queens. These remains, with the crowns still attached, might I add, were from the 15th century. What a find, right? Well, sadly, the remains were all over this flooded tomb now. It wasn't really in one spot. It was horrible. And now after these discoveries, that's when things got really mysterious. Those involved in the findings began to die off in unusual circumstances, one after another. And it happened pretty quick, too. One professor had died after falling down a shaft in his apartment. He had a heart attack. An engineer had died before him as well due to undisclosed medical issues. Okay. Another professor, years later, who worked in the crypt as well, became paralyzed at age 62. A sculptor involved died when untying his shoelace. Just the weirdest way to go out. That's the only details that we know. Just, I don't know, use your imagination, I guess. Maybe he fell and hit his head. That's sad, it's tragic. And another professor died in 1936, shortly after visiting the crypt as well. I sure hope this isn't an ancient curse because these guys were trying to preserve their history and avoid the crypt from flooding. Like, I don't know, we need a Ouija board to clear this whole thing up. We were trying to help you with the sandbags. Number eight, Queen Caroline. In a list of unusual ways that people have died, odds are it's going to get a little gruesome, a little messy. After all, that's why you click this video, right? Right? Some ancient queens die natural causes and then history remembers them for their reign. In this case, history remembers Queen Caroline for the way that she died. It was written in an epigram from the 18th century from a poet named Alexander Pope. It, he wrote down, here lies wrapped up in 40,000 towels, the only proof that Caroline had bowels. It rhymes? Like, come on, man, you didn't have to do this. This is horrible. That's like a prank almost. I can't believe somebody was like, yeah, 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 write that down. That's good, that's good. Did it rhyme? Yeah, she'd like that for sure. R.I.P. Number seven, Anne Boleyn. The second wife of King Henry VIII. Yes, we have a few on this list. She was found guilty of treason and she had been charged with having sexual relationships with five others, including Lord Rochford, AKA her brother, George Boleyn. Yeah, the uh, ancient days were a little bit odd. She had also apparently had relations with Sir Henry Norris, the king's close friend. And when I say close friend, I mean he was the groom of the stool, so they were tight. He literally would wipe his So on top of this, Anne was also found guilty of conspiring to kill her husband. Now, it's since been proven that these crimes were a bunch of rubbish, basically. Anne wasn't even present when these events went down. She was still recovering from the birth of her daughter, future Elizabeth I, so there's no way in hell she was fooling around with the groom of the stool in October 1533. All five guys involved were executed on Tower Hill in May 1536, and then two days later, Anne joked about her little neck before being taken out with a sword as well. There wasn't even a coffin for her burial. Somebody had to go and get an old elm chest from the tower armory. They used a chest to bury her body near her brother, Lord Rochford. A chest, horrible, that's so horrible. At number six, deadly affairs. Dating is hard. If you've ever been on dating apps like Tinder or Bumble, then you know that things aren't as easy as it may seem when it comes to finding someone that you remotely like. 
Maybe we should take a page out of Queen Nzinga's book when it comes to dating because it seemed like she had fun with her escapades. Well, maybe don't actually do what she did because it's actually pretty gruesome, but you get what I'm saying. Queen Nzinga from what is now modern day Angola was a busy woman. After taking over the throne from her brother, she juggled the monarchy, wars with the Portuguese, and having a love life. The queen pulled together a harem of only the most attractive men, but because she was such a busy person, she didn't really have the time to walk into a room and choose who she was going to sleep with that night, so she came up with an alternative solution. Nzinga would have two members of her harem fight each other to the death every night, and whoever won got to sleep with the queen. Solid plan, right? Well, the winner wasn't really all that lucky for too long, because she would have the winner executed the following day. Number 5. Diamond Scandals Queen Mary wasn't the only queen with sticky fingers, it seems. The affair of the diamond necklace has sparked many conversations. France's queen from 1774 to 1792 was Marie Antoinette, and if that name sounds familiar to you, it's because she was the last queen before the French Revolution. She was also known for spending a buck on jewelry. She liked she liked the diamonds. Now this Countess de Lamotte was this young lady, a friend of the Queen, supposedly, who entered the French court in 1785. Now she got somebody to disguise herself as the Queen and then she acted like she was in love with this high society member, all to get her hands on this 12 million dollar necklace. Now she said that she would pay, but never ended up paying a dime, so that's horrible by itself. And the Queen supposedly had no idea about any of this or what happened to the necklace. Although this countess pretended to be her friend beforehand. The public went on to hate her for this, not believing in the scandal of course. One of the most notable lines from Marie Antoinette was when the French spoke out for not being able to afford bread. She apparently said, well let them eat cake which led into the French Revolution and ultimately her demise. Shine bright like a diamond I guess. At number 4, Test Drives. Catherine the Great of Russia was well known for a number of things. She was known for being a good leader, a strong ruler, and surprisingly for her naughty bedroom fun times as well. She was well known for her adventures in baby making, and there was once a rumor that she did the deed with a horse. Obviously that wasn't actually true, however she did do it with a lot of men. The only problem that she really faced when it came to finding a new partner was actually having the time to do so. I mean, it's not like she could swipe through Tinder while sitting on her throne, right? What was most important to her was finding a new lover who was skilled in the sack, and she didn't really want to waste time on testing these guys out, so she had someone else do it for her. Catherine had a friend take her potential partner out on a test drive, so to speak, so that she wasn't wasting her time on someone who couldn't meet her standards. Remember, she is a very busy woman. It is said that on a couple of occasions, Catherine's tester friend was caught in bed with Catherine's partner again, well after the Empress was with him, and that made things a little complicated, but I imagine that they got past that. Or at least I really hope they did. Number 3. Change Religion Ruling alongside the pharaoh Akhenaten from 1353 to 1336, Queen Nefertiti aka Lady of Grace aka the Lost Queen of Egypt was only 15 years old when she married 16 year old Akhenaten. Now alongside her new young husband she built an entirely new capital city called Amarna and ruled over what's now considered the wealthiest period in ancient Egyptian history. But when it comes to spoiled queens or rather queens who could do anything they believe with their power, we have to mention the queen that changed Egypt religion. Both her and her co-ruler were in a cult, the cult of the sun god, Aton. In the earliest accounts of the queen, she assisted her husband in a ritual that smited the female enemies of Egypt at the time, and there have been a few blocks that have since been recovered from the Thibian tombs of the royal butler that depicts the queen wearing her unique blue crown, part of the sun god rituals. So now cut to the end of the king's ruling, the Aton was now Egypt's main god. Some queens change laws, others change religion. At number 2, Fake Village. Imagine being so privileged and so disconnected from the world that you pretend to be poor for fun. Well that's pretty much what Marie Antoinette did. This French queen was known for her lavish and opulent lifestyle and that's really the only life that she knew. Apparently living the life of a rich queen started to get a little boring for her and she wanted to find an escape and so she got her people to build a fake village for her so that she could pretend to be a commoner. This fake village included 11 cottages, a lake, a water mill, a 
working dairy, a windmill, a barn, and other quote unquote peasant buildings. Maria apparently loved this little peasant village and she would bring other people to enjoy it too. When she brought her guests to the village, she expected them to yes and their way through the day and really immerse themselves into their role of a common person. She would even tell her ladies to ditch the ball gowns and wear something simple to blend in. Marie even took her kids to the fake village to teach them about farming. Even though she loved her pretend peasant lifestyle, it still didn't help her bond with the real common people and it certainly didn't save her from the guillotine. And finally coming in at our number one spot, surprise entrance. The last true pharaoh of Egypt, Cleopatra VII ruled from 69 to 30 BC. She's known mainly for her love interests, of course, her two mans, Mark Anthony and Julius Caesar. And to this day, we're still trying to uncover more dazzling details of the lost queen. Now, she ruled alongside her young brother and her life was much more than being just beautiful, which is what everyone seems to focus on more than anything. Both children were assigned to the throne, Cleopatra being 18 and little bro being 10 years old. So Cleopatra, being a little older, therefore a little wiser, became the ruler. A couple of years passed and eventually Cleopatra was pushed out of Alexandria over her greed for power, classic, but her little brother, equally a co-ruler, had her driven out. He was jealous and honestly, I'm the youngest of my family, I kind of get it. But Cleopatra wasn't quite done yet, she had a few tricks up her sleeve. Believing she was the goddess Isis, reborn, this beautiful goddess, Cleopatra made these dazzling entrances whenever she could. Most notably in 48 BC, right when Caesar arrived in Alexandria, during that family feud with Ptolemy VIII. She wanted to meet the Roman general, but she couldn't be seen, because there was a little bit of family beef, so she had herself wrapped up in a linen sack, and then personally delivered to Caesar's bedroom. Hashtag your order has arrived. Surprise. Now she won the heart of Rome's future dictator here, obviously, and eventually she regained Egypt's throne. Her brother wasn't too fond of this alliance, and in the following battle, he drowned in the Nile River, resulting in Cleopatra's return to power. At number 10, blinded by ambition. I don't know about you, but I think my favorite part of these queens list is learning about all the wild and crazy things that queens did to keep or acquire power back in the days of old. Like these gals were absolutely ruthless, and they weren't afraid to absolutely body anyone who stood in their way. We've heard about queens taking out enemy tribes, their husbands, and even their own family members. This all sounds like a round of Call of Duty when you're the last one on your team and you're just murking everyone in sight trying to save your own skin. Let's talk about a queen, or rather empress, who was so desperate for power that she ended up killing her own son. Irene of Athens was an empress from the Byzantine Empire who ruled from 797 to 802 CE. She started her reign as as co-ruler alongside her son, Emperor Constantine IV. Though it started as a good old family business, you know, saving people, hunting things, not really. Things went south as they normally did back then. Irene wanted all the power to herself and so she sought out to eliminate her competition, her own son. Irene lured her son into the very room that he was born in and gouged his eyes out. Like ma'am, this is not ice cream. You can't just scoop eyeballs out and make a sundae out of them. Thank you. That's not how that works. <laughs> Constantine ended up dying as a result of his injuries and since his own heir had passed away earlier that year, the transition of power ended up going to Irene who became emperor. Yes, emperor, not empress, because she was the sole ruler, making her the first woman to do so. Number nine, topless duels. Yeah, you heard me. Hungarian princess Pauline von Metternich was married to Prince Clemens, but she was born in 1836 and she had to marry her uncle when she was 20 years old. So. Surprise, surprise, she was unhappy. Who knew? Weird, right? Since the marriage began, her husband was involved in numerous affairs. He liked going after actresses or singers, anyone glamorous or hot or cool. He barely paid any attention to her. That is until, you know, she started to have fun, live a life maybe. Yeah, once she got over this gross prince, she had a great time. She drank, she smoked, she partied, she defined convention, but most notably, her duel in the summer of 1892. She challenged another royal, a countess of the matter, to a duel and nothing but a corset. Now, to this day, it's not yet determined who exactly won this duel, this corset poke-off. But a princess dueling in the dark after some drinks, that should be a musical, not Frozen. Get out of here. 
At number eight, no side bays. A bad relationship can really mess you up. Anyone who's been through a bad breakup can tell you that. Not as many people carry that pain with them as much as Catherine de' Medici did back in the day. Hurt didn't even begin to describe how she felt and she really embodied the pain that she was feeling after having her heart broken. She basically turned into the type of person that was like, if I'm not happy, no one else is gonna be happy either. Catherine's husband, Henry II of France, had a mistress and Catherine was well aware of it. They had been having an affair for basically the whole time Catherine was married to Henry and he loved his mistress more than he ever loved his wife. When Henry was on his deathbed, his final request was to see his mistress one last time and as a final F you to her husband, not only did she deny the mistress from visiting Henry, but she literally made him die alone with no one by his side when he kicked the bucket. On top of this hatred towards her husband though, Catherine was also an absolute B word to her daughter as well. Catherine would fight her daughter over her romantic affairs. I guess she didn't want her daughter to be like her father. Either way, Catherine got so mad about one of her daughter's affairs that when she found out about her lover, she locked her daughter away in a castle and never saw her again. Talk about a serious grudge. Number seven. Two for one. When you're deemed the most beautiful woman in all the realm of England and the most loving, well, odds are you're going to need two husbands. All that love to give, it only makes sense. Joan of Kent was named as such, and at the age 12, so gross, she was married for the first time. She fell in love with a knight named Thomas Holland. Yeah, she dated Tom Holland, the knight Spider-Man guy, that's great. He was 26 and she was 12, still gross, but they got married in secret. She knew her parents wouldn't be on board, he was broke, and yeah, he was also 26, so so for obvious reasons, it had to be a little hush-hush. Even in royal standards, that's a bit odd. After the wedding, Thomas had to go off to war and he wasn't gone for too long before, well, she remarried. The son of the Earl of Salisbury slid into her DMs and Joan thought Tom Hall and Spider Knight was dead. Well, Thomas returned, like he did in Endgame, but they were legal issues now. Ultimately, Joan and Thomas got together and had four children, but after Thomas did die, Joan became the first ever Princess of Wales. So if you love someone, just, you know, marry them. Even if the other person's still just over there, just marry them both, see what happens. Number six, Mary Queen of Scots. If you're a murderino, this one's pretty juicy, listen up. Back in 1565, Mary was determined to take the throne for herself. When Mary was just six days old, her father, King James V, had passed away, so she ascended to the throne. She was about to marry the King of France in 1558, but he passed away, so she returned to Scotland as the country's monarch. Her next plan was to marry her cousin, Lord Darnley, so now, if something were to happen to Elizabeth, Mary would be yet again lined up for the throne. That cousin ended up dying in a random explosion, and then years later, in 1568, Queen Elizabeth had welcomed Mary after she fled to England. So Mary was close, but now what? Well, Elizabeth had found out that Mary was involved in English Catholic and Spanish plots to overthrow her, so she was then placed on house arrest. Fair, more than fair, more than fair. Cut to 19 years later, 1586, a letter had emerged revealing that Mary was involved in a plot to have her cousin, Queen Elizabeth I, killed. She was then sentenced to death and her head was taken off for treason. History is dark, my friends. Even if you're family, it's, shit gets crazy. Number five, Charlotte Augusta. Princess Charlotte Augusta of Wales lost her life in 1817. And when I say ancient, this is probably the most recent that I'll go, because I know ancient means way back, I gotcha. But I have to include this one because as far as royals go, she was loved at this time. She ended up falling in love with Britain's Prince Leopold, but a year and a half later, she died giving birth. She was healthy at the time. She was only 21 years old when this happened. Charlotte was lined up to be the queen one day and historical accounts say that the doctors here were at fault. Charlotte's tragic passing had vendors running out of black fabric. That's how rocked the public was right after this. Just massive displays of grief. What do you guys think? Comment down below. Was this a doctor conspiracy or just classic medieval times? It's the olden days. We can't really do as much. Let us know. Number four, Catherine Howard. Queen of England from 1540 to 1541. Such a short amount of time, but why? Being the fifth wife of King Henry VIII, cousin to Anne Boleyn, referred to by King Henry as his rose without a thorn, he just gave her all the gifts and she was just 19 years old. Sounds great so far, but you know, because of his list, things won't end up well. Their marriage didn't even last a year until rumors, not letters or eyewitnesses, rumors started spreading about infidelity. There was a small amount of evidence that suggested that she had been romantically involved with somebody beforehand, so a jealous mad king got jealous and mad again. Shocker. You had me at fifth wife, I don't know. She was executed for adultery and treason at the Tower Green on February 13th, 1542. Number three, Catherine Parr. 
When Catherine of Parc got a position in Princess Mary's house in 1542, she met King Henry VIII. She was smart, she was 30 years old, so it was a step in the right direction age-wise when it comes to these queens and King Henry. Not that there's anything wrong with marrying somebody younger, that's not what I'm saying, but it's just, well, look at this list, all these people died, spoiler alert, so the older the better at least, I don't know. She was seen as somebody who could nurse the king in his dying age, so the public liked her. She was the first English queen also to write and publish her own books. Now come 1543, Catherine gave up her man, Thomas Seymour, to marry the king. The two got married that July at Hampton Court Palace, and from that point on, her beliefs were deemed dangerous. Queen Catherine was a supporter of the English Reformation, and Catherine's religious opponents were plotting against her, and they tried to convince the king that she was dangerous. Her arrest was even planned, everything was kind of going in a bad direction. And then Catherine went to King Henry right away and then asked for forgiveness herself. You know, for pushing her views too far many times before, and he forgave her. Meanwhile, others are losing heads for having relationships. Okay. Her and Henry were married for five years, and then after his death, she married Thomas Seymour just a few months later. And then come September 1548, she died after giving birth to her daughter. The account of her death comes from a lady-in-waiting and friend of Catherine Parr, comes from Elizabeth Tyrant, only her account is fishy because she never liked Thomas Seymour to begin with. She made it seem like Catherine was speaking about her husband in a negative manner when she was dying, and this is the only time in history where that's ever been an idea. So what do you think? It's like broken telephone, but hundreds of years ago. I'm like, I, maybe she was friends? I don't know. Sounds like conspiracy. Number two, Anne of Cleves. Where to even begin here? Okay, this one is sad, man. Anne was right in the middle of Henry's wives. She was married to King Henry for six months, and it was seen as quite strategic in a way. Henry's chief minister convinced him to marry one of the sisters of Germany's Duke of Cleves, either Anne or Amelia. So in order to decide, Henry requested that Hans Holbein travel to Cleves to paint a portrait of each sister. This is like the birth of Tinder right now. I'm not joking, this actually happened. This man compared portraits and then chose Anne because every man praiseth her beauty. She was compared to the silver moon. Yeah, try that on a dating site. I praiseth thou beauty, madam. Super swipe. A treaty was signed and a few weeks later Anne arrived to England. Henry was beyond upset because she looked nothing like she did in her portrait. Yep, real life, this is what really happened. He tried to stop the wedding because of this, but it was too late. They had to follow through and they got married on January 6, 1540. Anne later accepted the divorce because obviously a divorce was in play after what you just heard. And then she lived as the king's sister peacefully until her death in 1557. Of all the ways to be remembered in history, King Henry made this horrible for Anne. And finally, number one, Cleopatra. Last of the Egyptian pharaohs and last on our list. One of the biggest questions to this day is just how Cleopatra died. What happened? It's been rumored for a while that a snake bite was the culprit, but many believe that Cleopatra also allowed a poisonous snake to end her life. They think it was a bite from an asp. But there's also a large amount of historians that also believe that she poisoned herself using a hairpin. Her lover Anthony fell on his own sword, but Cleopatra, she just poked herself. She barely lost blood. Now, as a young end, we have to note that Cleopatra was brilliant. She was also interested in learning specifically about chemistry. So this theory about her poisoning herself doesn't sound very far-fetched. Until we find her body, we'll really never know. What do you guys think? 